All right, welcome back, everybody, to the Optimum Drive podcast presented by TFL. I'm your host, ex Top Gear Stig Paul Gerard, for another midweek podcast. And today's guest is awesome. If you love driving uh, at any level, this guy is the right person for you. He's got such an amazing resume. Uh, of course, that's why I have him on here from uh, being a, a driver himself. Uh, to being a driver coach for every level, from pro to complete novice. So I think we're going to have a really fun discussion uh, today on, with Optimum Drive, and we're going to go through everything, sort of best practices, uh, typical things he sees from students, and anything else that we can possibly conjure up in our minds over this podcast. So without any further ado, I want to introduce Peter Krause. Peter, how are you, sir? <laughs> well, Paul, thank you so much for inviting me down to the on your podcast. I mean, I've been an admirer for a very long time. And, and uh, you know, I really appreciate what you've done with Optimum Drive. I think it is a, a must read for anyone who is a serious student of the sport. Um, you know, I, I love learning new things. And uh, I read your book, and I learn new things. And, and that's why I do this is because I'm always learning. Uh, the more I do this, the less I seem to know for sure. And that's that's what's really, really fun about this sport. Yeah, for sure. And it's uh, it's funny because it's, you know, human beings teaching human beings. We're not a bunch of robots yet. Uh, it, it's just like I think the, as long as you ever do this, you're just constantly surprised um, on the one hand, how, you know, with the individuals that you meet. On the other hand, I think every single time you teach someone, you learn something about yourself along the way. And, uh, and I think that is what that interaction between, um, you know, new student and then, you know, you think you've seen it all coach <laughs> always makes for just this amazing, you know, you just at the end of every day, you're just like, well, we got there, but I didn't think it was going to go the way it went. <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> <laughs> that's for sure. That's never, for sure. Because I mean, never a day with a student where where it, you're like, yeah, that's exactly how I imagined things were going to go. <laughs> no, no, it, it can't be scripted. You know, it can't. No. You have to you have to juggle the balls and see where they lay, and yeah. uh, and that's what's sort of fun about it. And you know, we I think as uh, as professional coaches, as, as, as coaches who work with people as a vocation, people who do this for their primary living. And there is a big difference, I think. And I, I don't suggest that people uh, who are not doing this for their primary living are any, have any less legitimate or valid ideas. I just think that the sheer volume of interaction with such an incredibly, I mean, I have worked with more than, I, I've worked with tens of thousands of people. I won't say a hundred thousand people, but I will tell you that it is tens of thousands of people because we put, uh, I, you know, so many people through so many programs I've been involved with, plus all the individual things. Then for 10 years, I was on the road for 200 nights a year. I was either uh, in a hotel room going to, at, or from a racetrack. Um, thankfully, that's, you know, I, I quit doing that a couple of years ago. Uh, you know, that took a little bit of the fun out of it. And now I work at my local track, which is Virginia International Raceway. I bought a commercial facility there uh, with simulators, two simulators, plasma screens on the wall. Remember plasma. Right, cool. and, um, and, and it was a way to meet with people at the track but not trackside because the garage and the paddock can be a very supercharged place with lots of expectations and eyes watching and ears open and stuff. And I really wanted to sit down with people and say, Hey, let's go through what you just did. Look at it together and just decide on one or two things to do next. Right, and right. that, yeah. That turned into a very successful methodology for me. It really, really, it really has. Well, you'd see why it would work. I mean, it's like super, super rational. And that's something that I think when you talk about the, the paddock, that's what we end up dealing with is a lot of irrational thought and behavior and expectations and all that stuff. So anytime you can, you know, you can strip that away a little bit, uh, that's, that's going to, you're going to start making progress with that person. Before we dig too deep into and by the way, a facility at VIR, well played, sir. Let's say it is, 
if you're watching this and you don't know that track, it is it is truly one of the great driver circuits in the world, and um, such a, such a, a wonderful track. Uh, but I, I want to find out a little bit. I'm sure the, the 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 listeners or the people that are watching this on YouTube would love to know a little bit more about you. So, how did you get started, like driving, and then that turns into coaching? Give us a little bit of background. Well, I think, you know, I think the big thing for me was I've always been a car nut, um, you know, mostly a car nut. I was born and raised in Philadelphia. I took public transportation. I was in love with trains, specifically electric trains, subways, elevated uh, electric trolleys for years and years in Philadelphia. I uh, then went to school in Massachusetts and uh, basically drank my way through college uh, or most of college anyway, until I came home one holiday and my parents said, that's it. Your plug is pulled and we are not sending you back. Yeah. My father said, we're going to get this car thing out of your system. Once and for all, we're going to go to Sears at the local mall, Northgate in Durham, North Carolina. And we're going to buy you $500 worth of tools. And, and you're going to get this out of your system right now. And so I said, okay. And I had owned a grand total of four cars by that time. Uh, because when I went to Massachusetts, I, there was no public transportation. So I had to start driving and I discovered that I really enjoyed driving and I love, I love Italy and I love the Italian style and I love the Italian design and the noise and the uh, form ahead of function sometimes and and all of these wonderful wonderful things that the Italians do so well and so my first car was a uh, Volkswagen bus 1967 bus I rebuilt the um, engine which was a 1500 single port uh, in my dorm room at college I would take wow. the sub assemblies up to the roof and had stainless steel serving pans that I stole from the commissary uh, filled with gasoline, trying to clean the parts. And people were really upset about that. But then I put the thing back together and I, I drove it and it started right up and it worked great for about 20 minutes. And as soon as it reached operating temperature, it seized solid. Oh, dear. And the reason why it sees solid was because I used a screwdriver to measure end play on the crankshaft when I should have used my hands to allow that. So I took it apart, put it back together again, did the procedure properly and drove the thing, I don't know, 7,000 miles in like nine months. And uh, I traded it for a Fiat 131 two-door coupe. Um, then I had a BMW 2002 TII that I put into the side of a house. Oh, what a shame. Uh, well, you know, I think that if you would ask me uh, 40 years ago where I was going to be when I was 64, I would have said, I'm going to be dead. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I think that's and a common theme, actually. <laughs> it really is. And, yeah. and, you know, despite it all, I'm here, you know? So anyway... Um, I had more, more Fiat's and I had, you know, more BMWs. And so, but I really only had experience working on those two cars and, and one was twin cam Fiat's and one was mechanically fuel injected BMWs. And so when my father bought me these tools, I uh, put little uh, flyers on every car at Duke university that I wanted to work on. And then I'd go out to the research triangle park, which was uh, exploding at that point in the, in the early eighties. Uh, with um, IBM and GE Aerospace. And there were a bunch of 2002s and a bunch of twin cam Fiats in the, in the parking lots. And so I'd put stuff on there and, and people would buy stuff and they would, you know, they pay me to take care of it. And, and it, it turned out to be great. It was so much fun. Uh, I really enjoyed it. I learned a lot about cars. It was really a good thing. Um, but then what happened was I started working for a Fiat dealership and uh, you know, the Fiat dealership had been around since 1966 and they had a Fiat 850 spider, which I thought was a beautiful little car. The problem was it, I mean, it wouldn't pull a grease string out of a cat's ass. It had no power, nothing. I mean, it sounded so fierce, but it was just a bunch of bumblebees buzzing around. And like 50, 60 horsepower, maybe, or something. Yeah, like maybe, maybe. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. 
And, and so I started skimming the head and opening up the exhaust and putting side draft carburetors on it. And then I finally started using a radiale head, which was a very fancy Italian uh, cylinder head that dispensed with uh, rocker arms and turned it into a, a basically a single red cam engine. Oh, cool. um, but it was really, really a lot of fun and I really enjoyed it. And uh, so by the time, I guess the late eighties, I said, you know, I want to go racing. And I, I was being mentored by a friend of mine who was an SCCA club racer, raced at an RP24 Royale, uh, oh, Formula yeah. Ford, great old car, really good. Um, I didn't really have an interest in driving open wheel or formula cars, but something that really caught my eye was sports racing cars. And sports racing cars to me are like, God. Uh, you know, bliss, uh, give me an LMPC car, give me a DPO two, uh, give me a sports 2000, give me any of those cars. I, I, I love, um, you know, purpose built cars, uh, with body work that, that are swoopy and look cool. I, I was driving an Alfa Romeo GTV six, which sounded great. I was working on a bunch of Aston Martins, uh, V8 Vantage, uh, and earlier cars, the DB two, four Mark three, the Felton built hand built cars, um, and spending a lot of time, sort of attaching myself to owners of these rare and unusual cars um, in the hopes of being around them more so that I could learn something about them. Uh, I remember there was a Maserati Ghibli coupe uh, that was in the front yard of the local Merrill Lynch dealership. And I was wasting my time playing video games at Lakewood Party Store when I realized this guy had this stunning Maserati yeah, Ghibli car, yeah. just yeah. unbelievable. Yeah. So I, without any self-awareness, I walked into the front door and I said, um, who owns this car? And it, his name was Will Grant. And he was a Merrill Lynch uh, agent. And he said, uh, what do you want? And I said, well, I know everything there is to know about these cars. And that was, that was just, <laughs> my wife is laughing in the background. She said, <laughs> she just said, right. <laughs> right. Make it till you make it. <laughs> That's right. And, and, and the only thing I really knew about these cars was reading road and track and car and driver in Perkins library at Duke. That was it. And so uh, I walked in and I, I, you know, he pushes the keys across the table mm. And he's and I'm waiting for him to say, like, OK, go, go change the oil or something. He said, Peter, I'd like you to change it from an automatic into a five speed. Oh, my. <laughs> so I really screwed up. I mean, I yeah, yeah. It, it took me three months. Um, there was a wonderful man, uh, Kyle Fleming from Virginia beach who had a Maserati junkyard, who, who was another great mentor of mine. I, I fell into the lap of people who really spent a lot of time with me. Yeah. That was what was the most incredible investment that I, I didn't learn to appreciate until very recently, you know, all the people that I've ever learned something off of, it's just amazing. And yeah, I feel you. Cause I feel the same way. Like I just look, look back and go, I was really lucky to bump into these people and for their, them to take an interest in me. Um, mm -hmm. So lucky. So I think that's a really cool thing to value and make sure you thank them for their gone kind of thing. Right. Absolutely. You know, yeah. I mean, that was, that was what was really cool about it. And I, I think that I just getting back to the racing thing, my racing thing, I started out driving uh car and time trials in solo one, which is uh, one at a time against the clock on the racetrack, SCCA and vintage. My primary interest started in vintage and historic racing because that's where my customers were. Um, all of the people that I worked on had these stunning cars, like old Maseratis and old Alfa Romeos and old, uh, a beautiful Lotus Elite, which is one of the most beautiful cars in the world, built in the late 50s, uh, 1960, absolutely gorgeous car. And um, so I really enjoyed uh I had an opportunity to drive some of these cars for the owners. Uh, I had spent a lot of time learning autocross and solo two when I first started because I couldn't afford anything else. Right. And it was another great way to spend time with your friends learning. And my best friend, Holland Hale, 
and I traveled all over the Southeast. Uh, we won a bunch of state titles, uh, which were sponsored by BFG, um, and, and did a lot of that stuff. And that was really, really a lot of fun. Um, we, we had a great time. And, uh, so then all of a sudden, I, I wanted to race myself. I wanted to race my own car. And I didn't really care what it was, but it turned out to be the 850. Mm -hmm. And um, the car, for whatever reason, had no juice. I mean, you know, it just wasn't that fast. But in the wet, it was crazy, crazy good. And, and I love driving in the rain because... I can feel everything through my fingers and I can feel everything through my shoulders and my butt and everything. And my head is on a swivel and I'm already like in advance, know where, which end of the car is going to go. And to me, uh, racing in the rain with this Fiat 850 was just a great experience for me. And I love, I love that. It was a really good thing, but it really got me cemented with the historic group. Now I had a shop and I, the reason I had a shop was because I had one money guy who came in and, and paid for it all. And I looked after his car and took care of his car and transported his car. We bought a tractor trailer, turned into a big rig of four cars going crisscrossing the country 12 times a year, going to all these different events. But the real reason I got involved in starting the shop was because I needed an infrastructure to go racing. Yeah, exactly. It wasn't it wasn't yeah. about it, it wasn't about my good friend Nick. Yeah. It was about me. It was yeah. about having a slot on that trailer so that I could roll my car inside and I could go racing. Mm -hmm. And I remember, you know, you got to catch them early. You got to catch the money guys early because honestly, it's a 3-year it's normally a 3-year cycle. Everybody gets in, they take the school, they do their car, they get on track, they go, wow, this is great. And they do it 20, 25 times a year. The wife threatens to change the locks on the front door. They realize that what they have is a great street car, but it's not necessarily a good race car. So they, the next year, they buy a race car or a better car. Then they start spending money. Well, we're going to put together a team. Oh, I need a transport. Well, we're going to do this series. Well, we're going to do that. And, and they work harder and they work harder and they work harder. And, and you know, they have uh, just as much fun, usually, um, unless they have bad luck. And, and my, my racing luck was very good the first year. My racing luck was terrible the second year. Mm. But I realized that this was all part of the game. You know, you just had to be stoic about it. You said something that really resonated with me, which is sort of trying to push down the emotion and be rational about things rather than irrational. All of these things uh, play to our passions. So we sit there and we say, you know, uh, let's just dive on in. Yeah. But by the third year, these money guys, they start adding it up, you know, and they say, mm, I don't know about this. And the good ones are in it for the long haul, five, yeah, 10, 15, yeah, yeah, yeah. 20 years, you know, but, but that's okay. I really enjoyed what was the fact that, that my had a facility to go racing and it worked out great. I mean, it really worked out well. And, I started uh, driving larger cars, medium bore production cars in SCCA and SCCA national competition. I uh, was uh, Southeast division, you know, top two for many years. Um, you know, SCCA used to be the only game in town, but it's really not anymore. And, and it, it, it really hasn't been for a very long time. It has never been easier to go racing or driving on the racetrack than it is today. And that's yeah. kind of fun, yeah. but it's also confusing. You yeah. know, I think it's confusing to a lot of people because there's a different regimen for each group. You know, some groups are very serious about this stuff. Other groups, not so serious about this stuff. And a lot of groups, they don't know what they don't know. And yeah. you and I've had this discussion before. And I, I want to hear more about what you think about that. Um, <laughs> we could get ourselves in trouble with this, I'm sure. But, but the thing that was really good about the whole thing um 
was was I I got a chance to drive a lot of cars. I had another guy start racing Sports 2000 with me. His name was Paul Tavilla. He was a produce distributor originally from Boston, Massachusetts, and uh, moved to uh, Fort Lauderdale, Florida. He was a top-level national driver, once picked to win the runoffs uh, in Sports 2000. And um, he wanted to go Sports 2000 racing again. And I said, uh, okay, let's go. And so he bought a, a, a Swift, and I took it apart and put it back together again. I really didn't know much about uh, sports racing cars, um, but I sort of started gradually adding pieces together and making things work. Um, but the great thing was that Paul had a ton of money. And Paul said, you know what? We should buy and sell a whole bunch of these things. And between 19, what was it? Uh, between 2001 and probably 2014, I think I bought and sold almost 60 Sports 2000s. And people, and I sold them into historic racing, not club racing. Club racing was dying for Sports 2000. But vintage and historic racing, it was a great way. I was sick and tired of the production-based racing where you just added more money and the guy drive away on the straight. If you didn't have the right car that year, you were done. You know, there was just no fixing it. But I love the idea of a spec series that wasn't so restricted that the chassis uh, had enough variation so that all these cars drove differently. And I had a March. I had... Uh, Oh my goodness. I had a Lola. I had a Chevron. I had a whole bunch of Tigers. I, you know, I had a ton of Swifts, Carvers, all kinds of these cars. And, and they, I wanted to drive every one of them because I wanted to feel what it felt like. And, and I just feel tremendously blessed because I was able to drive so many different cars and I don't spend a lot of time tuning cars i'm i'm not a big uh engineering guy i mean you i have great friends who run top level national uh, spec racer for gen 3 programs and all of that i think that there is no car that cannot be driven quicker by somebody else mm -hmm. and that is one of my i don't know uh like a foundation to your a, a foundation of yeah. everything i believe in yeah. you know yeah. um and and the thing is that people say uh people say well how can that be and i say look it happens all the time all you got to do is look and the so anyway i'm getting ahead of myself so i i i had an opportunity to race uh thousands of times between 1984 eight uh i i did say that um brian redmond was my chief instructor for my first historic race school cool. i just tell a quick story he was yeah, yeah. uh he was he was he's an incredibly incredibly humble man mm -hmm. and the reason why he's humble is because he's glad to be alive yeah because he tells the story all the time that at the driver's meetings in the late 60s early 70s at major sports car races and major Formula One races where he was driving, he would look left and he would look right. And he would know one of those people was not going to come back. Yep. And he got burned at, uh, in a fire at, at spa and uh, broke some bones uh, when the car flipped over on him at Tremblant. Um, and, uh, but he's been incredibly fortunate and he is so gracious with his time and experience. It is unparalleled. Um, he never treated me like I was tail end Charlie with the smallest car in the group. He would tell us very simply what the objective for the next on track exercise was. And one of the exercises, this was after, I guess, the beginning of the second day. He said, I want you to get on the apex. And everybody's laughing and shrugging their shoulders. And yeah, I'm, I'm already doing that. <laughs> and he said, no, I want you to get on the apex. And I'm going to be out there and I'm going to be watching. And so we go out and go ride around. 
we have a good time. And all of a sudden it turned to at Roebling Road, which is like the second part of Big Bend at Lime Rock Park. Big, big arcing, very fast, uh, more than 180 degree turn that double, doubles back on itself. There was Brian standing on the curbing. And I sort of made some calculations in my mind, you know, because I'm, I'm a big accuracy guy, you know, I'm, I, I, I mean, maybe it's a leftover from mechanicing, uh, from, from spending a lot of time working on Ferraris and Maseratis and Lamborghinis and unusual cars that require precision. Otherwise they're lumps of molten metal. Expensive. And <laughs> really expensive. And yeah. I couldn't afford it as a shop exactly, owner. So yeah. Double it, measure twice, cut yeah. once, you know? So, or measure twice, shim once. I couldn't afford the mistake that I made on the Volkswagen bus on a guy's F40. Oh my God. Yeah. Just so, down at that point. <laughs> <laughs> get out of town. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Shut all the accounts down. Leave now. Yeah. So, so the big thing was that he was standing on the curbing and he was actually standing just behind the curbing. And so we all started edging towards it. And I said, the hell with this edging, I'm going to get there. So I ran, I put the center of my 175 70 13 Goodyear NCT <laughs> right on the middle of that curbing about, 12 inches from the toes of his feet. He didn't flinch. He didn't move. So the next lap, I said, okay, I'm going to go a little bit closer. And so I put it in three quarters. So I was about eight inches from his toes. He didn't flinch. So on the third lap, I said, okay, I'm going to get right on the inside edge of the curbing. I'm going to make the right side of the sidewall where it meets the tread, be within two inches of his toes at 70 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. And I went through there and I had to make a big correction to nose the car in. I had dropped throttle and the thing stepped out and had a little <laughs> yaw moment. And he, got his attention. <laughs> he didn't flinch. He didn't flinch. And, and, and so I, I, I missed it a little bit, but I said, okay, fine. So the next lap, I did it perfectly. And he took one step back. Mm. Golf so the checkered flag came out. Yeah. And I'll never forget it. We all gathered together on the pit lane after everybody comes in. And he said, Mr. Kraus, you get the gold star today. And I was like, why is that? And he said, because you were the only one that made me step back. <laughs> and and you know i think he taught me a valuable lesson he just said you know look you've got to you know when people say hit their marks it's more than hitting a six by six or 12 by 12 or yeah. 24 by 24 it's it's hitting a 50 cent piece it's yeah. hitting a quarter three laps four laps 20 laps in a row because if you can't do that you can't evaluate the changes that you make in entry speed, trajectory, geometry, any of that. Yeah. And so getting ahead of myself, I, I did the, the car repair thing. I got to the point where I was the largest independent Ferrari repair facility between DC and Atlanta. We had some spectacular cars in there. I was very active in the Ferrari club, which I found to be very welcoming and not snobby at all because people drove their freaking cars at the track events. Mm -hmm. I mean, the owner of Road Atlanta before Don Pano's, uh, well, two of the three owners, there were three owners, Leo Hendry, George Noose, and um, uh, Jim, uh, oh, I can't remember his last name, Canely. And, and they were all members of the Ferrari Club. And George Noose had a Comp Daytona that he used to drive the living snot out of. And Canely had, uh, I mean, all kinds of cool things. And Mike McCoy had a Tyrrell 014 F1 car. And I mean, people were really cool and, and were very free and open with their information. And uh, I had a, my business partner, 
I had a couple of Ferraris and he was very liberal with my use of them, uh, which allowed me to explore dynamics in a higher powered car. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll never forget. I went to a, a driver's ed event where I was the chief instructor. Uh, I guess it was a BMW club event uh, down at Roebling again, Roebling road, one of my favorite tracks, very fast average speed over hundred miles an hour on a lot of laps mm -hmm. with quicker cars. And a guy who was a customer of mine had bought a brand new uh, E36 M3 lightweight. Beautiful car. Very advanced for the time. I mean, people sit there and they look at these cars like they're vintage cars now, and they are. Yeah. Um, 240 horsepower doesn't sound like much, but man, let me tell you something. That was a ton uh, 28 years ago. Mm -hmm. A ton. So everybody was whispering up and down the pit lane. Well, now that Krause is out of those little, you know, bumblebee cars, let's see if he can make a big car go. Well, that ended about two laps into it because I just did more, bigger, better, faster, you know? And that's what everybody really wants. Every driver wants it. Every, yeah. every team owner, more, bigger, better, faster. And, um, you know, Mark Donahue with the famous quote, you know, you don't have too much power if you can still leave two strips of black tire rubber from track out to the break point. Yes. <laughs> There's no such power. thing as too much power, yeah. right? Yeah. But but I was actually drunk, made drunk by the brakes of this BMW because I had never had to brake much in the little cars. You know, I mean, yeah. I used the slip angle, the development of the scrub at corner entry to set the trajectory, the yaw angle of the car to sustain that yaw angle through the given trajectory I wanted to take. And for that, I didn't really need the brakes, you know, because I wasn't really going that fast. Mm -hmm. But in the big car, I had to slow down. And so I learned a whole new language which was this whole idea of brake release and ross bentley a great colleague and a great friend talks you know about eob end of braking which i think is a wonderful uh talk uh a wonderful way to describe it uh dion von molke i think did uh did everyone a great service by talking about you know if you're on the power too soon you're done braking too soon you know, because everybody's idea is, well, if I'm off the brakes, I should be on gas. But they don't realize that it's counterproductive if the car is not yet pointed in the right direction. So I was able to sort of parse this stuff out on my own. And I had been to Skip Barber Racing School. The chief instructor was Bruce McGinnis uh, at Lime Rock. Uh, this was 1989. And, uh, oh God, I think, I think there were a bunch of people there. Zemicki, uh, Mike Zemicki was there. And I think Mike is, you know, one of the most brilliant people clever, that I clever know. Guy. Clever guy. E ex extraordinarily clever guy. Yeah. And, you know, he doesn't always rub everybody right, yeah. but I think that's his point. You know, yeah. he says, look, yeah. if you can't take, yeah, don't ask. And, and I love that. And I didn't learn until 40 years later at Watkins Glen that I matriculated to college in Western Massachusetts. He was sitting on the steps of the same college waiting to get on a bus to get out of there. Wow. And I, I said, why'd you do that? He said, he said, because I was struck with the idea that somehow this was not my destiny. That driving and racing is my destiny. And I took a bus from Amherst, Massachusetts to Lakeville, Connecticut, and went to work for Skip. And I went through the door of the college, saw all of these beautiful young girls and all of this liquor and all of these wonderful things. And got lost for a couple of years. <laughs> so so he you? was a lot better off than I was. He got a much bigger head start than I did. Anyway, the point is we go back to McGinnis 
uh, who was my driver's ed 10 years, uh, my CI 10 years later, uh, after the, after the infamous, uh, you know, passing two ships passing in the night, Zemicki and I, um, but, but what was really cool was McGinnis took note that I was obnoxious and forward and took a bit interest about what he was talking about about and i was eating it up a decade i'd, I'd won a bunch of state uh, titles and uh you know done reasonably well in the beginning of scca my scca competition driving the slowest car in the field but um what he said made sense and and so i was really set on i really saw the magic of teaching and i love the idea uh, I, I saw light bulbs go on, including my own. And I was like, man, this is so cool. What a charge. And um, so I, I worked hard on the shop and I worked for the next 15 years. And I got to the point where, you know, after working on cars for 27 years, I was sort of tired of it. And my business partner who was a new business partner at that time and bought out the old one. We'd gone through a rough patch uh, the new business partner had streamlined a couple of things in the back. Uh, he said, look, I want you to sit in that office and I want you to fill our semi-tractor trailer. We have 72 slots for sale this year. I want you to fill every one of those going to races and don't come out of that office until you do. And that was fine because we were sucking wind at that moment. Money was probably 2004. And, um, and so I, I did that and I did that reasonably well. And I did it well enough so that we turned, we went from being very much in the hole to being very much in the good in about 15 months. Mm -hmm. But this guy coming from a corporate background said, we need more, bigger, better, faster. We need another tractor and we need another trailer and we need another 12,000 square feet and we need another five guys. And this was the summer of 2007. I said, no, no, I don't really want to do that. I'm, I'm happy with where I am. I'm making more money than I ever have. I'm getting to race whenever I want, wherever I want. Mm -hmm. Why would I want to change? And he said, well, you can buy me out. I said, no, no, you don't get it. I'm the sweat equity guy. You're the money guy. He said, oh, I need to buy you out. Mm -hmm. And I went, oh, my God, this will never happen again. This is my lottery fucking ticket. And, sorry. Anyway, it was incredible. It was one of those light bulb moments. He was very fair with me. It did not make me wealthy, but it satisfied all my obligations, vested some significant amount of retirement and allowed me to walk away liability free from something that I thought and I'm just going to make an aside here. Every good shop owner that I know, they would do it. Not if the mayor, they would do it. You know, I think of people like Brennan, people like, I don't know, all kinds of different. Sean Creech is another good example. Uh, in the historic world, uh, Brady Rafenig. At nine one shop. Um, I mean, I think of all of these people. I mean, it's, the list is way too long for this podcast. But I know people that are so passionate about this; they would do it for nothing. And I was that way for a very long time. And I thought that the end of my shop time was going to be I was going to keel over with a heart attack. They were going to come in, padlock the door, and call in the auction company, and people would find oil pans for a Daytona and a differential for a 365 GTC4 and valve covers for a 250 inside plug engine and all of this priceless stuff. And uh, But it was worth nothing for me. You know, I mean, I, I didn't turn it into money. I just was a hoarder, for God's sake. Yeah. And... Uh, I, I just accumulated it over, over decades. And um, so I didn't realize how liberating this would be for me. And I've always been interested in learning new things uh, before Sims got uh, a 
to be a big deal in 1997, 1998, I bought a Pentium processor, uh, uh, IBM ThinkPad, and I started playing uh, IndyCar 1997 and mm -hmm. Papyrus games and, uh, you know, Grand Prix uh, and Grand Prix 2, Grand Prix 3, Jeff Crammon, all those people. Um, I mean, uh, it's never been a game for me. Simulation has never been a game. Simulation has always been a tool to learn tracks, learn how to drive, discover what the car will do with a given input without having to spend money and do it in real life. Right. And yeah, it was crappy in the beginning, but the physics got better before the graphics got better and people would get stuck on the graphics. They say, ah, it's a video game. No, 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 no. The car behaves the way it's supposed to. If I turn the wheel too quickly, the car steps out and then I have to fix it. That's a simulation. That's not a game. So I remember, uh, you know, I've always been into, uh, and I'm sorry for this stream of consciousness here. You know, I, I you wanted to hear more. That's what you're here for. Well, I wanted to hear more about, we'll, we'll have a chance to hear more about what you think about a lot of things, because I respect you very much, and I respect your book very much, and your approach, and your methodology. But I've always been a big deal about mentoring young drivers. I didn't know where those drivers were going to go. I didn't know what they wanted to do. I just, if I saw talent, I tried to encourage it. Um, an intern, a summer intern at my shop in 1997, 1998 was a young man named Tom Long. And Tom Long is one of the most gracious, knowledgeable spectacular coaches and exceptional drivers all the way up to prototypes for Mazda as a factory driver. Yeah. Um, anyway, he worked as an intern in my shop, sweeping the floors of my shop, riding with me to mid Ohio in the heat of the summer, staying at the terrible Motel 6 at Belleville off of Interstate 64. Oh, it was horrible. It was terrible. But we had a special treat. I had brought with me the first Sony PlayStation. And I had with me the first disc of Gran Turismo. <laughs> and so we busted ass setting up at the track in the afternoon and then we went right back to the hotel and we played Gran Turismo until three o'clock in the morning. We slept for three hours and we went back to the track and I went racing, won the Enduro that, that, uh, that event, uh, you know, was up front in group three, which is medium board production. And he busted his butt, keeping me going. Anyway, he came back for a second year in 1998. And I think it was because, it wasn't a problem if people stopped working and went next door and fired up the, the, the PlayStation and did a couple of laps, you know, but anyway, uh, I was his chief instructor for his first SCCA school in 2001 at VIR. And at that point in time, I knew that he was very special and I did everything I could, uh, to help him to function, you know, I was not his agent. I was not his lawyer. I was not anything else than a proponent for him. Uh, his parents, uh, both of his parents are lovely people. Um, and, and they, uh, Glenn and Elena, his, uh, his mother, uh, what a, what wonderful people. And, um, Anyway, he was raised right, as they say in the South. Right. And, and that means a lot. Uh, if you say that about somebody, it means that you can depend on their word. You can, without a handshake, rely on what they say they're going to do. And uh, Tom was exceptional. He was the first MX-5 uh, Pro Series champion in 2005. Uh, and he just went on and on and on from there. And um, it's been fun to follow his history. Uh, James Clay of Vimmer World. I was the chief instructor for his first high performance driver's education event at Roebling Road in 1997. He came down with Barry Battle 
They had started Bimmer World and an E30 M3 that they worked on the entire school. I'm not sure they got 20 laps. They were working on that car all the time, but that was the start of, of, of James. And, and uh, you know, I spent time racing in BMW CCA club racing with James, uh, you know, and he is not only an exceptional talent, but an exceptional businessman. And uh, he does everything he can to help grow racers. And that is, that is a yeah. gift. That's a, a gem. Yeah. It's it's great. It's not only great for business, it's great for the sport. And, course, and yeah. it's it's symbiotic, you yeah. know, it feeds off of each other. Um, you know, people like Seth Thomas, who I have a uh a great uh respect for, you know, he worked uh in a family lumber yard and outside yeah. of Atlanta, uh became an exceptional driver there, actually. In, I know uh, Seth won, uh, world challenge races. And into races, yes, I know you do. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, um, you know, countless other people. Corey Lewis uh, in the picture behind me. Uh, this was Petit Le Mans in 2008, uh, as he's about to go out and win the uh, Continental Tire uh, Challenge race uh, in a in a Porsche Cayman um, for Frank DePew with Rebel Rock. Um, you know, Frank was his personal sponsor at the time, and uh, Joe Courtney helped him out a great deal in the Lamborghini Super Trofeo, which allowed him to become uh, allied with the Lamborghini factory effort. Uh, and he's now won the Sebring 12 hours twice. Um, you know, I love following the history of these guys, the development of these guys. Um, I don't think racing is gender specific. I think the skill set is uh is not not gender specific um as a matter of fact 20 percent of the people that i work with uh 20 of my client base are women yeah. uh, both in historic yeah. racing and high performance driving education so when i say guys i say that as the yeah the universal guys but by 2007 um gps data and video technology had been out for a few years Mm -hmm. race technology in england who i first learned about from john heinrichy and don knowles mm -hmm. who were doing test yeah, engineering yeah. driving for for gm they don knowles said this is the baddest thing since sliced bread and i said it's a black box with a cigarette lighter plug a gps antenna and duct tape to the floor he said <laughs> that's all you need and I said, really? And I had bought the G analyst when I was autocrossing. So yeah. I had read all of his stuff and Pat Bedard trying to explain to me what the squiggly lines meant. So I understood what the squiggly lines meant in an effort to sell these 72 trailer spaces. We pushed a program called the banner racing program in my shop, my vintage racing shop. Cecil, my business partner drew this up. He said, not only are we going to take you to the racetrack, not only are we going to take get your car ready and prepared, not only are we going to keep it up, we are going to coach you. We are going to help you get better. And we're going to use technology to do it. And I picked, because I was going ground up instead of pro down, mm -hmm. I picked TrackMate, which was a very simple, very easy to understand preloaded template of simple limited information but information that could tell you right away where you could go faster and i said you know i've heard people offer their opinions to other people on how they should go faster i have heard for decades this secret line or i need to teach you the <laughs> racing line i need you to teach you the double secret entry into this switch back i'll learn the handshake first though oh and i'm sitting there <laughs> just wanting to punch the guy out you know <laughs> saying you are perpetuating falsehoods you don't know have you ever measured of course not i just know and I was like, no, wrong. So I got, it was the intersection of a lot of different things that started my career as a club level coach. And I'm not saying that I'm any better than anybody else. I will tell you that I was there 
really early. Yeah. And yeah. I, yeah. I can tell you that the only person that I know of uh, that was full-time earlier than me um, was E. Paul Dickinson, who I owe a great debt to because he, uh, he is very verbose. He's just like me. He loves to talk. He's got a great vocabulary. And so by listening to him talk and reading his material, I learned a lot about how to present complex concepts in simple terms. That mm, people that's a key understand. point there. And I think that's I think that's a, a, a point that people miss. Yeah. Is, is a lot of people giving the information are so drunk on their power to yes. deliver it that they forget that there has to be a catcher. There has to be a catcher with a mitt that can catch the ball. If you throw the ball at 200 miles an hour, chances are it's either going to go right through that, that glove and in one ear and out the other, or it's going to frustrate the person. And, and I didn't want that. I really didn't want that. So anyway, uh, E. Paul was there. Uh, Jim Pace uh, did a lot of private coaching in the beginning um, I mean, it was really sort of a nascent profession that was waiting for it to be woken up. My best friend gave me a reality check. He said, my best friend, Holland Hale, we spent, you know, we traversed hundreds of thousands of miles throughout the Southeast, throughout the 80s, racing and doing time trials and doing autocross. And he was the he was a fellow high performance driving instructor, uh, sitting in the right seat of, of folks' cars in countless schools, uh, giving his information and and forwarding his wisdom. But he turned to me and he said, "How are you? How can you expect to make a living doing what other people do for free?" And I was like, I was frankly taken aback. I was like, you know, I. I didn't really think about that part. Yeah. Um, and it was very sobering. It was really, really difficult. And I got to tell you, I, I starved for three years. So 2008, 2009, I spent a lot of time uh, teaching people how to use the chase cam video, which was a really cool tool at the time. Uh, TrackMate, uh, race technology, a number of very basic video and data acquisition devices uh, to try to help people learn. And so what happened was it changed for me overnight. And what happened was I started teaching six people a weekend for like 150 bucks each. And it was really a slog. I mean, I didn't have enough time yeah. to do the job right. Yeah. And then I said, okay, I'm going to charge three people, $300 a piece. And, and that was better, you know? Um, and then I realized, you know, I really needed to make it worth my while and I needed to do it enough to get good at it. And so I, I spent a lot of time on it. And the thing that was interesting was, I was not, not getting overrun with customers. And I was like, you know, maybe I'm in trouble with this. Maybe there's not as much of a demand as I thought there was. I was focused on historic racing because I was well known in historic racing. Mm -hmm. I was the chief instructor for SVRA, which was the largest uh, vintage sanctioning body nationwide. Um, and I was their chief instructor for 24 years. We ran all kinds of schools all the time. It was great. I was a known quantity. The big difficulty uh, that I had was overcome by a simple news item on the front page of USA Today's sports section sometime in late 2009, early 2010. And what that was, uh, was in response to a question from a sports journalist, uh, the great golfer, Tiger Woods, said, um, you know, the, the, the question was, I paraphrase, but how is it that you do so well what you do? And how do you keep improving? And uh, Tiger 
was very simple and straightforward in his response. He said, I have a coach. And I think you could have heard the mic drop at that moment <laughs> because here's the greatest. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Heads exploding all over the world. And uh, especially with amateur and even pro duffers, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, and so what happened was not only did it turn out that he had a coach, but his coach was his caddy. And people were saying, you know, how could a guy that, uh, you know, shot a, uh, you know, double digit handicap over Tiger, well, maybe not that, uh, be his coach. It was, uh, he was very clear about it. Tiger said, we have a collaborative arrangement. We talk about things together and then we make decisions going forward. And man, I tell you, my, the light bulb popped off in my head again. And I said, you know, that's how we're going to sell this thing. We're going to sell it as a collaborative effort, not me telling people what to do. None of this downward flow of information. That's, that's old fashioned. That's legacy. That's, that's, it's not wrong. It's just not as effective. Yeah, At least, <laughs> yeah, 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 that's right. So, so what I uh, did at that moment, I, I would say that in the couple of weeks following that news article, um, I went from um, eight bookings the month before uh, to 24 bookings um, the next month. And um, the next thing was that I was working, uh, I think uh, I owe a great Debt of thanks to uh, my friend, uh, uh, Chris Musanti, who runs a Porsche shop in Hartford, uh, near Hartford, Connecticut. And Chris is a great racer. He's a great driver. Um, he can't tell you what he does. He'll tell you that. But but he's he's an exceptional driver and he's a very, he's a very good human being. And uh, he called me up and and he said, uh, he, uh, he knew me from historics because he has a bunch of historics, but his primary business is Porsche club racing. And honestly, I had been racing against Porsches my whole life. I mean, when I was racing my Fiat 124 Spider, I had a, a decision to make, uh, again, at Rubbly Road in turn two, whether or not to back off or hit a 356 ahead of me. And such was my enmity towards Porsche drivers at the time and the way that they raced me, I chose not to slow down. And as the $300 taillight flew over my head <laughs> and I got by, I rejoiced inside. Now that quickly turned to shame when I got back to the pit lane and the guy who was driving the 356 turned out to be a friend of mine, Ernie Cabrera, who was also an alpha guy. And he said, you he said, you, of all people, why did you do that? And I said, I'm sorry, I had the red mist. Anyway, the point is, I've always had difficulty with Porsches. I didn't work on them in the shop, didn't particularly care for the owners, didn't know the cars very well, liked the racing cars, the purpose-built racing cars, but had no knowledge of them. Um, and then when I raced them, some of the most difficult racing I've ever had is with other Porsches, you know, yeah. uh, I've had some really good ones. I've had some great, great uh, races. Uh, Peter File uh, had a wonderful time uh, down in Daytona. And, and anyway, the point was, I didn't think much about Porsches, but my friend Chris Muzani called me and he said, look, I've got a customer who is treading on th thin ice and he's gone from a spec boxster, which is on probation for multiple incidents to a uh, 997 GT three R. Okay. And I was like, you like putting large grenades in the hands of children? What is this? <laughs> and he said, no, he said, he said, I can't get through to him. I've told him you're coming. I put it on, on the bill get here so i flew down to sebring and i drove across the bridge over sunset bend and to my right 
was the most extraordinary grid for a club race I had ever seen. There were 70 factory built race cars racing for a $6 trophy false grid. And I went, oh my God. This, this, this exists under the radar for me. I mean, I never knew. I mean, I, I'm used to working with BMW drivers saying, well, can you do it for $50 less? And, and, and you know, and anyway, who, who was uh, his client? And he was successful that weekend. Um, and he was successful the following weekend where he stuck that car on the pole in front of Corey Friedman, which is no mean feat. Uh, unfortunately, he had a, uh, he did not notice that there was a weeper uh, between the lanes of pavement and turn 12 at Road Atlanta. And precisely when he left, I think you know where this story is going. Uh -huh. he, he, uh, and, and he chose to let him have better off, but we didn't know that at the time. And precisely when they waved the green was when his left rear 18 inch wide tire was square on the wet, wettest portion of that weeper. And as the power came in, he spun in front of the field and it was a very, very ugly wreck. Wow. Took out a lot of nice cars. Um, so uh, the biggest thing was, the biggest thing that came out of that was uh, that People said, okay, the shop is the same, the car is the same, the driver is the same, what's different? It's Kraus. So all of a sudden, you know, I became relatively hot property in PCA club racing. Um, and I had never run into a group of people who were more enthusiastic about their cars and about driving on track. And the, the thing that was remarkable to me about it was I found that I could work as much as I wanted to with the demand from just that group. And um, it would, um, and that really sort of set me off to a period of time where I was traveling 200 nights, 200 days a year to at or from a racetrack. I have uh, just a tremendous slew of clients and, and customers. I still maintained an interest in my historic racing. Um, one of the people that I've been fortunate enough to work with uh, is Jim Farley, the CEO of Ford. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know who he was when I met him. I just walked up to him and I said, you know, well, oh, you're looking at your video. And he said, yeah. And we looked at his video and I said, you need to do this, 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 and that. And um, walked away. And at the end of the weekend, I was uh, walking by his garage area. And he said, uh, where are you this next event? And I said, I can be anywhere you like. So um, we, I don't spend a lot of time with career clients. Unlike a lot of coaches, I don't have... The old Skip Barber model was as an instructor of Skip Barber, you would find and capture a uh, enthusiastic, wealthy Skip Barber student to build a team around and you would exchange coaching and organizing the team and operating the team for seat time or running a second car. And realistically, you know, I wasn't interested in driving anybody else's car. That was the big thing was people were saying, you know, what are you getting out of this? I said, I charge, I give people a bill and they get <laughs> value is what Crazy they get. Concept. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and people were sitting there like, well, don't you want to drive? I said, I want to drive my car. I want to take my, my advice that I give to all the young drivers that ask me the same question. How do you get into racing? You get a good job and then you take that money and you go racing. That's the way I wanted to do it. <laughs> and that's how it worked out. That's how it worked out. I mean, I raced 
15 times in 2010, you know, um, because I was able to afford it. And two sets of tires a weekend, my budget wanted for nothing. And I won a lot of races and got a lot better and kept doing that same thing. The cycle, you know, rinse, lather, repeat, you know, so whatever. Anyway, I'm not interested in in the Skip Barber model where I find somebody and latch onto them. I'm more interested in buzzing in and buzzing out and saying, let me give you so much information. I can only operate at one speed. My speed is 110%. I am going to feed you from the fire hose. You are not going to run, remember or even conceptualize some of what we're talking about, but I'm going to give you enough to work on for the next year of you going back to the track. And I'm going to teach you my methodology for where I find this information so that you can learn how to do it yourself. And that empowering, especially with the aid of technology, you know, the technology was such a hard sell, man, in the beginning. People are like, I don't want to bring a laptop to the track. I don't want to do this. I don't know how to operate Windows. I only have a Mac. And I'm like, look, I'm not your computer tutor. I'm telling you, look at speed versus distance. Look at longitudinal G versus distance. Compare the top three laps. The areas of the most variance, work on those. Simple stuff, really simple stuff. And you know what? I'm still doing that. No matter how high the level is, whether somebody is looking for three seconds or three thousandths of a second, the methodology is still the same. But this, this technology thing was really interesting to me. As I talked about before, building my own sim rigs before it was a thing, experimenting with 3D FX, voodoo, graphics cards, ATI, Rage, which turned it into AMD graphics cards. Um, I mean, that stuff is positively antique. You can find it for three bucks on eBay. Yeah. And I probably have a box in the garage full of these old cards. Um, but but the thing was that the, the technology intrigued me and I would oh I would always supply the technology. I would bring my technology to the track and put it in my clients' cars. And they they were not against it. They just weren't interested in committing to it because it was a tool for me, not for them. That changed because I showed them hey, this is a tool you can use to help yourself. And as hard as a sell as it was in 2012, data at a club level is now nearly ubiquitous. Absolutely. I mean, it. I think if I'm, if I'm more proud of anything, it's, it's the fact that I've, tried to make data approachable and actionable for somebody that doesn't do this all the time. Mm -hmm. And it got to the point where I was, uh, in order to learn how to use all of the data systems, and this, this goes back to my ADHD, where I needed to buy 60 different Sports 2000s and take them apart and put them back together and race them to learn the differences between them. I became a dealer for uh, race logic for VBOX in December of 2010, when I was at Sebring with uh, the the founder um, Julian Thomas, uh, who's gone on to bigger and greater things, and uh, Nigel Greensall, who was his U.S. agent at the time, and who's a wonderful coach, who's an extraordinary and marvelous, marvelously amusing man. Very, he and his wife are uh, just exceptional people and fun to be around at the racetrack. So um, that was really a lot of fun. Then I became a dealer for AIM, which I found to be the steepest climb and honestly still do uh, for club level stuff. I find MoTeC uh, easier than AIM to get the information I need to make instant decisions. Um, I, I still like VBOX 
uh, because I'm most familiar with it. I because it presents only the information I need mm -hmm. to make the decisions I need, uh, and because by displaying a, a spreadsheet of sector times on the top left hand side and being able to click on that, one of the big well, I go on after. So I became a dealer for eight different brands. Pretty soon by 2018, 2019, uh, just before COVID and before the pandemic, the business had gotten so strong that it was, it was as much as the coaching business in terms of gross revenue. And, uh, and the thing that was surprising to me was it was it was uh, starting to run my life, and and I the pandemic gave me a brief re reprieve because it was difficult to get pieces for a while, but then it came back even stronger. Motorsports has come back stronger since the pandemic. I don't know whether it's YOLO, you only live once, you have to do it now, or what, or more disposable income, or whatever it is. Motorsports has never been as popular and as easy to access as it is now. And so my equipment business, which was started off as only, you know, a sideline, turned into a multi-million dollar business. And I said, I don't like this. This is running me. It's just like the shop. And so I found another fellow uh, who's very good, Ray Phillips of uh, Precision Driving Analytics. And he bought the business from me and is doing very well with it. Um, I have gone back to, uh, you know, I, I think I sort of had this illusion in my mind. I mean, yes, I have the passion for coaching. Yes, I have the passion for motorsports. I still get in the car. I still drive around the track. I still have my race car. I'm not as active as I have been personally on the track, but I still am at the track frequently. And I, I think that retirement is, is a nebulous thing. People who are passionate about things, uh, especially as passionate as we are about racing and driving, don't retire. They can't retire from their passion. But what they can retire from is the, the what they can retire from. What they can retire from is the need to do it as an economic sustainer to go racing. And through the success that I've had in both private one-on-one -on -one coaching, small group coaching, team coaching, and building presentations for organizations and teams, um, plus the equipment sales, which exploded in the 2018 through 2022 period of time, um, I've been able to be able to reach a point where I can work with who I want to, when I want to. And to me, that is bliss. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I took a short break. I bought a, one of the most beautiful, small, open day sailors I've ever seen. It's called. It's gorgeous. Uh, I, hope, I hope you were going to bring this up. Well, <laughs> you know, I have never worked so hard to go so slow in my life. Exactly. Sailing is uh, uh, has many parallels with mm -hmm. driving and racing. Slip angle, uh, environmental changes that happen uh, continuously. And your eye is fixed on the area you want to go, and everything is working to keep you from being able to do it. <laughs> and to me, that was a wonderful challenge. And, and you know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I told you before, I spent so much time and I'm so supercharged in my total commitment effort when I'm with clients that I needed a decompression zone. And that was the decompression zone for me. My wife and I bought a home on the North Carolina coast, uh, three hours due east of here. Uh, I was in the boat every month for five years. Uh, year round. I kept the boat in the water. I could be underway in five minutes and packed up in 10. Uh, I'd drive down in the morning. I'd sail. I'd drive back. The Lovely. reason I had my boat there was because the wind always blew, which was really important because uh, I did get an electric German torpedo motor, which was uh -huh. really cool uh, with a GPS 
integral range finder on how much range you have according to how much throttle opening you have. It was, it's, you know, it's total geek stuff. But um, my wife and I didn't really bond with the town. And, and honestly, she had a lot of stuff going back here. And I was getting actually a little bored because I was missing what you and I talked about earlier, which is the interplay that stimulates our minds by interacting with others in a mutual, in realizing a mutual goal. Mm -hmm. And so I guess in the spring of this year, 2023, uh, Lynn and I made the decision to sell the house. Um, I decided to keep the boat down there and go down there as often as I could. Um, and that didn't really work out because I was one foot in one camp and one foot in the other. But by the time the summer rolled around, my phone was starting to ring off the hook again. And, you know, I'd been successful telling everybody I sold my equipment business, call Ray. Uh, I'm sort of retired. I'm sailing now. People would call me up. They say, I don't really want to bug you, but. And I'm like, you're not bugging me. I, st I, I started saying, you're not bugging me, is what mm -hmm. I started saying. And so all of a sudden, the last two quarters at VIR, I have been slammed. And uh, and and I'm working with really good people, uh, some more successfully than others, but it's always a challenge. And as long as we can keep uh, that that path forward alive and possible, then we keep going. And, uh, and I'm, I'm getting a really good charge off of that. And it's, it's, it's getting the juices flowing again. And, you know, I bought a classic, uh, Italian car, um, uh, that I'm going through right now to sort of stoke those juices, because when you work on your own car, it's not as difficult as working on other people's for money. Uh, it becomes an, an avocation again rather than a vocation. So it becomes automatically more pleasurable. And, uh, but I really love working with people and I, I love coaching and I love uh, my collaborative efforts with, with Ross, where uh, Ross Bentley and I are starting uh, a new series of virtual track walks uh, using optimal laps from the Garmin catalyst, which I think is a really cool little tool. Cool. Um, the, the catalyst is actually the only proactive uh, coaching de data acquisition device mm -hmm. uh, in existence right now. I mean, there are other pieces of equipment that can guide you towards validating what you're doing on the track is better or worse. But this is the first thing that crunches the numbers like I would between sessions and say, yes, you're better here. No, you're not better here. You need to break 50 feet earlier here. You need to break 100. You're, you're not breaking hard enough you're wide of the apex. You're not tracking out all the way. This is the kind of audio feedback that this device for a thousand bucks provides. Yeah. Yeah. And honestly, you know, a lot of drivers could benefit from a stronger, sounder, fundamental base. And I think that's why I was attracted to your book and to your writings and to your postings. I mean, we have, shared orbits for a long time. We share methodologies. We share uh, mutual respect for the people that we think are doing it right. Um, and, and not to say that it's done wrong, but it can always be done better. Yeah. And, and that's what drives you and I and, and, and Ross and a bunch of other people that are, are, are really pushing this sport forward and the learning aspect of this forward. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely, we're always, I mean, the overall, if you were to use, try and select one word to describe motorsports, that word would be efficiency. Um, you know, so you can, you can use that to apply to tip to tail to everything that motorsports entails from the vehicle, the setup, the vehicle, the setting up of a team, the personnel within the team, <laughs> everything all the way through the coaching and the driver and the entire thing. It's, it's simply this sort of 
you know, this urge, this desire, this passion for trying to make things more efficient in our lives. And, um, and that's, you know, true with like spending time with a client coaching, you know, it's very expensive for them to be there that weekend. So you want to give them things in the right order and the right amount so that you're not plateauing them and stalling them. You want to just keep things always striving for a higher level of efficiency whenever you're doing any of it. Well, I love, I love your, uh, I love how you're strident about efficiency because really that's what it is all about. It's only about you know, that. That's yeah. that's the only thing that matters. Yeah. And uh, and I think that that was the wonderful thing about the tech for me was I was able to quantify efficiency. Yeah. Instead of of stand by the side of the road with a clipboard like we do at Skip Barber, like we did at Skip Barber, um, and instead we can measure it and we can say, okay, this is better. This is not. So let's move in this direction, you know, so. Yeah, that yeah. definitely, that, you know, it makes it quantifiable. And that's always a good thing because then it's not like, it's not the subjective observation when you're standing at a corner, but it's something that you can point to, you know, on the computer and say, this is the thing that matches up with my subjective observation. So it gives weight now to the subjective observation, you know. And we used to do that, of course, standing at the corner because, you know, we'd be up there with a stopwatch doing segments for them while we were standing on the corner and go, this is your quickest segment. And this is the line you, you were on when you did it. So, you know, that was our that was our early, early version. I remember Zemicki and, you know, we should go through the laundry list of the Skip Barber guys because I have just such fondness for all those guys. And um, but, you know, we in, in the very beginning, we would just look at exit RPM off a corner, just looking at the all we had was the tack on the car. That was it. And, a you know, an oil pressure gauge or temperature gauge. And so we would look at RPM, you know, when you just got your hands straight. What's the RPM? And that was sort of like the, you know, the the early versions of, quote unquote, data acquisition. Uh, and then now we're at this point where, like you said, you know, where we're talking to, to you know, John Heinrichy and those guys saying, hey, we've got this little GPS module that plugs into the cigarette lighter. And I, by the way, I had a G analyst as well. Uh, and I, I actually, I credit the G analyst. I remember like I was really obsessed with my driving then when that G analyst happened. And I was also a guy with no money. And um, and I had, uh, I was just doing autocrosses with friends. That's what we were doing. And I had never even been on a racetrack. Um, in those early days, I didn't have money to go to a track day. That wasn't really a thing back then anyway. Oh, track days SCC, didn't exist back then. You had then, to go yeah. SCCA racing. I mean, you had to kind of go do that. Right. And um, and so I love that G analyst because just seeing those the little graph that it would show and then having that friction circle there. And that taught me to be smooth. Like I, I credit that 100% with calming down my overdriving. 100% was the G analyst, Mike Valentine. Thank you. You, you provided my radar detector <laughs> that I still have in my car today. I do too. I I've, do got too. A I've got a Valentine one in my car and uh, and I had the escorts back when that was his company. And um, and then he came out with the G analyst and and that was a that was a big deal to me. And I'll tell you, um, the, the lessons from the G analyst, I went from being an inconsistent, quick, autocrosser to a dominant autocrosser um with the g analyst where i i from that point on i never lost an autocross that i went to um and i was jumping classes and doing anything and jumping in other people's cars all the time at that point they're like hey come drive my car once they see you're quick um and uh and it was the g analyst because it was it was like i was one of those a total overdriver like total because that's that's where the fun is. This is what I always have ever done, whether it's been my skiing or my BMX racing or my mountain biking, is I like being crossed up and over the limit because that's when I'm just giggling. Um, it's fun, right? And then, but then, you know, once once you're trying to quantify, because though we didn't may, maybe didn't have data, we had a time and that determined a winner and a loser. Um, once you realize <laughs> that you could overdrive and lose time, even though you're getting golf claps from the uh from the you know the uh, peanut gallery oh, going man you really had that thing hung out and you're like woo you know you're so it's like going for style points 
<laughs> full on style points. Like, and, and so that was, it was the G analyst. It, it was, it really was like, I, I look back at, at my mindset and how it changed my mindset. And this was without anyone talking to me about it because I didn't have anyone. Um, I was the guy with the G analyst. It was in my car. I remember how I had to wedge that triangular, uh, you know, accelerometer sort of suite that it had. I had an Omni GLH turbo. And it, that, was a, that was a serious autocross was a car. Design. Great little autocross car. And, yeah. and I wedged it in. I also had a like an 82 Supra. So that I had a few different cars, but I just remember wedging that thing in, in this little like cubby that was on the center console of the car. And it just fit in there perfect. Like it was made for it, you know? So uh, I have, I have really fond memories for the G analyst. And, and as you could tell, like I genuinely moved the needle for me as a driver. And I think like I, I had that pretty early on because I was autocrossing at like 17, 18. I didn't get in a race car till 24 because I promised my parents I'd go through college and, they didn't want me to race. They wanted me to do something else. So it was just kind of a, you know, just, you know, that, that was just sort of my situation then. But, but my driving had completely changed from that G analyst. I had got to uh, refine it quite a bit, just with autocrosses. And I was doing like Malibu Grand Prix, you know, and setting records at Malibu Grand Prix tracks. Like it was either an autocross or a Malibu Grand Prix, getting that club license at Malibu Grand Prix. And, um, and then I went to Europe and got in a race car. First time in my life, I was in a Formula Renault. And um, within three days, I'd broken the track record there and it won the, the competition. And that was my first time. But it was the G analyst. That was it. It was like an overdriver, completely passionate person that loved driving, um, developed a good feel for understeer and oversteer, developed good car control skills um, without karting, just, you know, Malibu Grand Prix karting. Uh, and autocrossing, that was where my car control came from, but I was playing around doing whatever I could always anyway, because I love being sideways. And mm -hmm. and then taking that and porting it into a race car. And, you know, it was interesting when I went to Winfield, um, they told us never to slide the cars. And um, they they uh, there was very little instruction given there. And this is my first ever exposure to anything. I hadn't done any school anywhere. I flew to the south of France, entered a competition. And they and they gave you this sort of basics of don't crash the car. And by the way, they had a rule there. If you spun, they sent you home. One spin, you went home. And you, oh I, mean, you spent, I, I saved up money over an entire summer of working construction jobs to put the money together to go do this. And um, and so, so, yeah, if you spun, you went home. And they gave you very rudimentary instruction on how to drive the car. One of the things they said was don't slide the car. And my buddy and I, who's actually, I'm still really good friends with, you may or may not know, he's the, the lead driver for uh, IMSA, drives the pace car, but his name's Tim Rose. And I've known Tim forever. And, um, and Tim and I were there together. And we stayed afterwards. We had rented mopeds, so we didn't have to ride back to town with everybody else. Because we knew that they were going to go out. They went out and tested your cars every day. And I'm like, I want to see how they drive the cars. Right. And I'm so glad we I did because I I had never had anyone really describe trail brake rotation or anything mm -hmm. like that to me. Like I, I did it. I did it as a matter of course, like that that GLA turbo. It was a tool in your toolbox. Yeah, it was just like that's how you go through a slalom. Right. Like the rear ends basically never stuck through a slalom. Like you just sachet it and control it and drive a straight line through the slalom, you know. And and so it was. So I knew what all this was, but, you know, they were, they told me you're in a formula car now, don't do that. And their one fast guy, and he was a guy that I became very good friends with, but his name was Roland Reese and he was their official test driver. And um, Roland was responsible. Like he was the, the guy that had Eric Bernard, Jean Alessi, uh, Elaine Prost. Like he was their guy, like at that school, they had all been through the school and, and there's more guys too, Olivier Panny. Uh, uh, you know, it, it, it's a long, long list of, of F1 guys that Roland had befriended. Um, and so I wanted to see Roland drive around the track. And so we stayed late and watched him. And sure enough, he was sliding the damn car on, on entry to almost everything. Because I said the car seemed like it had a lot of understeer. And I'm, you know, I'm trying to be tidy, but I'm like right, resisting, right, sure. resisting the urge to point it. 
And so, it, you know, that that simple stuff from the G analyst, here it comes like flooding back. Like that was my instinct was like, I need to turn this thing a little bit more. I need a little bit of what I ended up calling in my book, zero steer. I ended, you know, not oversteer, but but just getting the rear to drive, you know, to just to rotate just enough that I'm reducing steering and never going into counter steer. And that that was the like that's the secret of speed. If there yes. were one, it's reducing steering without going into counter steer. If you keep it in that little zone, the car goes really fast. Really and, fast. And, and so that's what I did. And I and I ended up breaking the track record of that track. And Roland told me the end of the first day, I hadn't broken the track record yet. It was like the very first day we're doing lapping. And he came up to me and he said, hey, have you ever done this before? And I'm like, this is my first day on a racetrack in my life. And he was just like, <laughs> and he told me, he goes, if this is true, you will win this year. And I'm like, what do you mean win? And he goes, you'll win the competition. And I'm like, the whole thing He's like, yes. And, and, and I went up to Tim afterwards and I said, Tim, did... Because I thought he was just giving me a line. I'm yeah, like, yeah. Did he tell you did that? He tell you <laughs> that if you listen to him, you'd win the competition. He's like, no. Did he say that to you? I went, uh, yeah. He did say that to me, <laughs> and it actually ended up happening. So it was really awesome. But, um, but it was like just. But again, I'm going back to that. That how that that silly little G analyst, which wasn't silly and little at all, like how that thing made such a quantifiable difference in my mindset as a driver and and i had had that all that time to really cement in staring at that data trace from that thing and looking at that friction circle of course the the um the, the g analyst was my first introduction to friction circle i remember reading that very nice little brochure that came with it that yep. explained all those concepts and, and talked about you know because it was again I, you know i had per, you know piero Cherupi's book and you know, it was breaking a straight line, release the brake, then turn the wheel, you know, because those old race cars, those vintage cars, like you, they were so neutral to oversteer that you couldn't right. trail brake really at all with many of those cars. Right. You know, or you didn't need to. What would happen? You didn't is need you just, to. Yeah. You get zero steer if you entered the corner at the right speed. Yeah. That's, exactly. what, that's, that's exactly what I right. loved. That's what I loved about historic. Yeah. Cars. Yeah. That's yeah, exactly. what I, I and love driving. Tires. <laughs> I mean, and, and I go through tires. I love going through tires, but but you're absolutely right. I mean, I think that that epiphany for you is, I mean, we have these things that trigger us and and allow us to transcend what we think we can do. And I think that was that for you. And, you know, certainly... Uh, you were able to put all of that information to good use and make it work, you know? Yeah. And that was, that was for me, it was, that set me on a, on a path and it, right. it, it calmed me down. It, it stopped me from overdriving. And it's the thing that I always try and get out of any student when you, you, you were putting it so well, where, you know, you're basically trying to create self-sufficiency for them. Like that's our end goal. When you say, I want to zoom in and zoom out. It's like, I want to give you the tools, I, you know, the, the old, you know, teach you to fish rather than give you a fish sort of philosophy. And, um, and that's what that got me was that understanding that that self-sufficiency of being able to, and there's a phrase I always use, you need to get to a point where you can feel what fast is. Right. And, and that it's really important because while you may have a Garmin catalyst kind of chirping away in your ear, telling you what to do next, when you go further up the ladder, you don't necessarily have that. And, and really you don't want to rely on that. You want to really, we're feel animals. It's completely it's, uh, subjective. You know, while you're in the car, it's completely subjective. It only becomes objective when you get out of the car and look at the data, you know? And, and so you, you have to develop that feel for slip angle, what the tires are doing at any given moment. And, and, you know, am I at the limit or not? It's just that constant. And I, I always joke with, with people like it drives me insane to know I drove six inches of a corner below the limit or above the limit. you know, like, like I'm not supposed to do that, you know, and it drives me crazy. If I find I'm modulating braking because I broke one foot too early, it drives me nuts. Like yes, yes, yes. I need to be thresholding right, right to the point where I, I'm, you know, bending yeah. the thing into the corner. 
Uh, you're blending yeah. it into the corner. Yeah, yeah exactly. I can't, I can't leave anything on the table anywhere. But all of that thinking, that thinking really came from that G analyst where I just think about that friction circle where that that little squiggly line is not allowed to dip in ever in yeah. towards the center of the circle. Circle. I got to walk it around every time, every time, or I have failed getting the car in the corner. You know, and if, if there's a spike outside that circle, exactly. Then yeah. you pay for it by it going back in just a little bit before That's it, it. Re rejoins. That's it. That's it. And, and but you can't. You know, I, I'm struck by the fact that you can't teach that overdriving. Well, can, I mean, I don't think you can teach somebody to intentionally go over the limit. I have exercises for that. Yes. I have that's what exercises I was that I work with my clients. I said, look, I want you to become comfortable being uncomfortable. Yeah. That's the only way you're going forward. Because if you're if you're not, you're just doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. Yeah. Yeah. And you, if you're just, you know, dawdling below the limit all the time as a driver, um, you don't, you, you start to get an irrational sort of safety buffer that you build in there where you start actually telling yourself you're only just below the limit, but you're actually quite a bit below the limit. Wait, wait and so minute. you don't know until you put your toe in the water. Every You got to do it a lot. You know, you got to do it every corner, every lap at least for a moment to go, oh, there it is, to know that, you know, what's, is the grip change, is the track change, is the headwind change, is the tailwind change, you know, all those things that are going to affect where that limit actually is and where you're supposed to be living is right, is right there. But it is, it's teaching that, that self-sufficiency to me that is the, the fun part for me. Like if you talk about like, why don't, why have I been doing it for over 30 years? It's because I love creating a driver that can feel because there is someone that's going to be an evangelist for driving for the rest of their life. Because once right. you, once you can feel that it's not it's not I'm just drive you know driving the thing around at seven, eight, nine, tenths. It's like I can play with a car. I, I can I can bring it there. And what the one thing I like to tell it's one of those entry like if you have these little statements you like to get in the first time you talk to someone, the first thing I want to tell them is like Sliding a car is not a loss of control. It's a yes. loss of grip. The car can still be controlled. So it's just like, get over that. Like it, it's not a loss. It's only a loss of control if you do nothing about it. <laughs> right, right. That's right. And a lot of people do. Then, people yeah. then you might have a point. But right. once you, when, you know, once you spend those two hours on a skid pad, which I fervently believe is the number that people need they need two hours on a skid pad and it's not like you're driving for two hours you come off you get back on you come off you get back on but it takes generally two hours to get someone to a point where they can subconsciously they have now ingrained responses for understeer and oversteer where they can chat with you while it happens um, which is always my litmus test like okay let's move on and and now we can now we can move on to detection and like you were talking about anticipation of these things being able to, and the, and the anticipation being correct, not this undershoot of the limit or an overshoot of the limit, but you, you're probably right. It's, it's very hard to teach someone how to overdrive a car. I think it, I'll, I'll tell you when I have got students to do it, when you spend a lot of time drifting with them, right? then they will overdrive a car. Like someone that showed up without car control skills and, you know, You've kind of built them into a driver and and they're they're competent around the track. And then you want to go in and, and that's a mistake a lot of people make on a skid pad is they make it a drifting session. Right. And that truly absolutely it, it's you the dark. One hundred percent correct. One hundred percent correct. Because once you're once you are completely convinced you can't lose control of a car, it sounds like the best thing in the world. Um, and it is from a safety perspective, it's awesome to have an incredibly high level of car control where you're like, I can take this thing into a turn and I don't care if the front slides or the rear slides and whether I expect it or not, I got, I got the tools to catch it. Like that is a, that is a great feeling to have, but that can allow people to overdrive. And that's where, and so that would be the only time I think, because I have had drivers as I've sat and thought about it, you said it a couple of minutes ago. Um, but those are the overdrivers or the people that get seduced by the drifting. Um, but then there's, there's also a finer level of overdrive. So yeah. 
Well, that's the, that's, the, that's the not getting the counter steer version of it. That's right. That's yeah. exactly right. So, yeah. so you have a situation where that's exactly right. And that's, that's a great way to explain it. And that's why your book is so cogent addressing that particular I, challenge. I have to look that word up. You know, <laughs> it just, it just makes sense. That's the thing. <laughs> <Thank> you know, <clears throat> I think of really good coaches and good drivers, especially all around guys like Mike Skeet is a really good example. Uh, I was chief instructor for Mike's first driver's school in 2004. And, um, and the thing that is interesting about Mike is he is unflappable. I mean, the guy is absolutely, I don't think his damn heart rate gets up very much in the car, no matter what happens. I mean, it's amazing. Um, but, but one of the things that I keep having to explain to people as I say, look, Mike is going into the corner a little bit warmer than he thinks he ought to secure in the knowledge that he can make these adjustments that you don't even see that allow the car to remain on the trajectory that he desires. And, and that's, you know, you talk about the limit. The limit was explained to me a very long time ago, and this may have come out of this, this Redmond thing where, where if you are on the limit, a change in the brake pedal position or throttle pedal position by as little as a credit card width will make a difference. Of course. Yeah. Or you're not on the limit. Or you're not on the limit because yeah. if you can make big changes, you're either way under or way over. Yeah. Yeah. That's you're always my, out of that, you're out of that window. Yeah. That's always been, but again, one of those foundational things I'll say on my first time talking with someone yeah. is, is like a lot of this sounds like I'm making up a bunch of rules myself. Like you have to do this. You have to balance the car. You're like, and they're like, Hey, I drove here and nothing happened. <laughs> Right. I've been doing track days. I, I break your rules, your rules all the time, you know, so therefore they are not rules. And I'm like, yeah, well, I want you to logically think about this. If I'm saying this is the only way that a car can get around a corner is if you respect the balance of the vehicle and you're breaking those rules and getting the car around the corner, what is the only logical answer? And the answer, of course, is you're driving too slow. That's right. These rules only apply at the limit of the car. You can break them. If you want to be a smooth driver, if you want to be the perfect chauffeur on the roads, then these balance rules work great for that. But I, I always use the example. They're just trying not to spill the drink in the back that represents their tip. Absolutely. The yeah. Limousine driver. That's it. But it's the same thing where they're trying to just very delicately do everything because the vehicle is, you know, the drink is at its limit. Uh, in, in the case when you're on the track, it's the vehicle and the tires and the contact patches that are at their limit. You're at max slip angle. You're approaching that with with one set of the tires or maybe all four. And um, so those are like super important foundational things with people, because th that's one of the things to me, Peter, that kind of drives me crazy is is when people coach or teach and they give novice students like latitude. It's like these are things that have to be earned with experience over time. And so you've got to give them rules, not guidelines. Like you have to do this. You have to do that. You have to place the car here. It's within an inch or two of that turn and cone, not three feet. That's not good enough to your Brian Redman. <laughs> make, make Brian step back for God's sake. Exactly. Yes, <laughs> that's for sure. But it's, but it's, that's, that's the way I think teaching has to be done. And, and, you know, I, I see people that are, especially these days where we tend to be so much more PC, we're trying to be very respectful of people's feelings and all of these. And it's like, you're doing something dangerous that could, could injure you, cost you a lot of money, and even worse than that, if you don't do these things well. So I am going to tell you that these are rules, and I'm going to say it in a very respectful way, um, but I expect you to take them as intended and not think of them as guidelines. And, and then once, once we can progress up and you start feeling these things, yeah, there's, there's combinations of things that get you the same net net at the tires. And so we can start talking about that. 
Right. Um, but until then, we're going to drive a car this way, and this is how you drive a car at the limit until you earn the Mike Skeen level of adjustability. And then you can do things with a car that maybe you're a little bit off the playbook a bit. But actually, when you when you get there, you'll understand they're in the playbook. It's just sort of... They're in the playbook. It's, it's in an appendix of the playbook. That's right. It's at the and end you can only the... unlock when you get to that level. <laughs> well, that's, that's, that's exactly right. Um, and that, what a great way to put it. Yeah, so so it's, it's always fun to... And that's, you know, you talked about like in the very beginning, how easy it is for people to get on the track and, and what a great thing that is where you have, you know, not only was it SCCA and then NASA, you know, but there was just, there's like a club for every car and every, you know, people that like red jackets racing club, you know, it's like, so you can, you can, you know, you can get on a track so easily, but with that now we have, of course, within every one of those groups are there instructors as it were and i use the little quote marks because it depends where you go and that, that's going to tell you kind of you know where where they're at and what they're able to do and you and you know it's like you know in, instead of everyone having to go through scca or on a certain path to get to motorsports or me go to europe and do it that way um there's a lot of ways to get into driving now and and with that it's a double-edged sword where it's it's amazingly simple to do it but then the quality is is now kind of goes all over the place and there are some clubs that have incredibly high levels where they absolutely put people out on skid pads and do paddock exercises and do you know just a corner exercise in the paddock which is you know god i mean the amount of time i guess the, the thing the thing that drives me crazy and you and i were kind of interacting on facebook about this the other day but it's when we're trying to fix things on the track it's so inefficient <laughs> Right. When it, when you're trying to teach someone fundamental things on a racetrack, you're going to realize like the amount of time it takes because the lap, the lap is so complicated. It's like, OK, I want you to focus on this one thing when you go out. Yet there's there's so many things you have to do just to navigate the course and get it around. So you can't a novice brain can't do things in isolation like that. Not efficiently. Out of all the people I've ever coached, one of the first guests I ever had on my podcast here is a dear friend of mine, a very good driver, but Tanner Faust, uh, who I was really mad about because Tanner at Velocity International, the last two Velocity Internationals, because he's a McLaren driver, but he's been in Senna's F1 car. He's been in Hakkinen's F1 car. It's, it This drives me crazy because <laughs> I want to do it so bad. But he does a great job and, and uh, he wheels those cars pretty well. But but Tanner, out of all the guys I've ever coached in my life, and like you, I'm in the tens of thousands of students. He's the only guy that I could ever, I have ever witnessed being able to isolate while driving full laps. Everyone else, it messes up their lap. But he was able to, he was able to do his same lap. And I would go look at the data and go watch him. And I'm like, oh my God, he's doing it. And he's doing it without tripping anywhere else because. He's having to step out of flow to do that. And he's having to focus consciously on this new thing. It's super hard. Like, it's so rare. And I bet maybe you have one or two that you could say, you know, I could give instructions like that. And they would do it without it messing up the whole lap. But that's why I'm, well, I'm it, such, it, such, it, such it, a it, proponent of <laughs> paddock exercises and isolating variables. Because once you're out there lapping on the track, it's just... There's just too much going on, you know, so it becomes yeah. pretty difficult. So that's so to me, the clubs that are doing a good job respect the need for people to spend a couple hours on a skid pad without drifting. And they need to do slaloms to understand transitional energy in a car transient response. And then they need to do corner exercises. And those corner exercises start out as a threshold straight line braking exercise. And then slowly transition to an ABS corner and stop. And then with a brake release, and now we're doing corners. And then you can do that corner. And then that corner, then the, the car control exercises, the skid pad turns into an hourglass or, or a figure eight. You know, so they get some transitional energy there. And they get corner entry into the next you know, corner where you're sliding. So now you can start to think about releasing some of the slide and getting into the realm of zero steer now is your corner entry. 
and doing right. all of that in the paddock because mm -hmm. doing that on the track is the most inefficient way to learn how to drive better and you're just just writing checks wasting money plateauing at the same problems you've had a year ago as a driver and even for coaches it makes life really really difficult and again i go to the word it's just inefficient um it's yeah. inefficient yeah. to do it that is definitely like you can take a, sure. even even when i get a pro driver first thing i want to do i'm like i want to see your car control Let's go slide around the paddock. And they're always like, I don't want to do that. I haven't been in a, on a skid pad. I'm like, that's why we're doing it. And there's never a pro driver, even up to IndyCar level, that I have done that with that has not loved it by the end and, and admitted willfully that that was a really good thing to do. And they and they now learned a lot. You know, it reinforces. And it's like your golf analogy with, with Tiger and his caddy. But you think of golf, you know, people – that don't understand the nuance of golf, which is just so insanely nuanced that, that, um, Crazy. you know, it's basically a single swing. That's it. The whole thing you do, at least we have three controls in a car. Like we're doing, yeah. you know, we're, we're, you know, we're doing, they, they just have a swing. That's golf. Golf is a swing, you know, yeah. but yet he practices the simple swing for hours a day. Right. And you're like, what in the world could he possibly learn? And it's just oh. like, it's just, it, it's not always learning. It's also reinforcement, and it's also making sure he doesn't build bad habits, which is what people do on the track by themselves all the time all when they don't have a Peter yes. Krauss in their corner. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. So it's just yeah. kind of understanding, like human beings, learning and then and then plateauing and then forgetting and then generalizing, simplifying things that we shouldn't be simplifying, you know, and all of that, and all of that just ends up with. A lot of the track driving stuff ends up being a lot of people, you know, just driving around a track, burning through tires at the limit of understeer. Right. And you're like, you know, it's not supposed to be that. No, <laughs> there's no, it's there's more. To be and and, and of, of course, like to get an appreciation for a car, like when you get someone that jumps in a car that's really neutral and they're like, whoa, I love this car. And the whole reason they love it is because they don't know how to tra trail break. I was like, well, I can make any car do that. You know, just by dragging a little brake into the corner and putting a little pin the nose down, watch the rear come out. Exactly. You know, it's like they they never get to that level where they can appreciate all these differences between all of these magnificently engineered cars that are, you know, kind of the passion that got us as little kids playing with Hot Wheels or, or <laughs> AF, AFX tracks or whatever I it remember. happened to be. I remember, you know, yeah. when we were sliding cars around on our carpet, yeah. you know, all of that, like, that's that's where the differentiation between all these brands and to me even like in the business where i do a lot of stuff in the manufacturer side of things and you know people come in and they're like you know they don't understand what makes a porsche a porsche a ferrari a ferrari a mclaren a mclaren a lamborghini a lamborghini there's different dynamics involved because all these vehicles are are basically put on the ground with different philosophies in place like what what's their priority list what do they think is important and the dynamics of a vehicle and all of that stuff is just to me like the the bedrock of why we do what we do and why we love doing it and if you just jump in a car and make it understeer around a track thinking that's the actual limit of the car it's just it's it's just kind of sad because there's so much more incredibly exciting sort of dynamics where you can make that car dance for you that's just yeah. waiting there low-hanging fruit as it were yeah. If yeah, you were yeah. to just go out and spend a little time on a skid pad or spend some time with a guy like you and uh, and they, their their enjoyment of vehicles, their differentiation between the brands and what they're capable of doing out on the track can just be limitless at that point. Yeah. And uh, and that's to me where, you know, where we beat our heads against the wall, because, of course, it's, you know, it's Dunning Kruger uh, all the way where it just <laughs> it's just, you know, you don't know what you don't know. And. We're just as guilty of that, by the way. We're human beings. We're all like that. But you just have to have that curiosity and be willing to put your your ego a little bit aside and have a little bit of humility and going, maybe I can learn something here. And um, and that's why it's great that you've had sort of the uh, success that you've had. I would love to ask you, since you have the simulators, do you do fundamental stuff on the simulators? How do you do that? Describe that to me, because I think that's interesting. So, for instance, I mean, I uh, 
in real life, I'll send people to Johan Schwartz or Tom Long at the BMW Performance Center down in Spartanburg yeah. for intensive skid pad training. If they have a simulator that they are comfortable on, then what I'll do is put them out on iRacing Centripetal, uh, the Centripetal course, which is just basically a big skid pad. And I will talk them through the proper way to train on a skid pad so that they don't turn it into a drifting session. It's so tempting. <laughs> it is so tempting. And so the problem tempting. is we all get you know, it. <laughs> everybody get it. who gets everybody who falls into that trap uh, is the same kind of person that, you know, where a little bit of knowledge is a very dangerous thing. Mm -hmm. They pat themselves on the back and then the next thing, you know, they're off. And, um, you know, I, I think that simulations, I love coaching people next to me in the simulator because I get to see where their eyes are looking. I get to see the amplitude and speed of their control inputs. I have a readout of real-time telemetry in MoTeC that I can look at to validate what I'm seeing. Okay, you are braking 30% less hard at this heavy braking zone than that heavy braking zone. Fix it. And, and really start, start, you know, just focusing on pounding home the fundamentals, you know. Uh, and, and people sit there all the time. They say, you know, you must talk about very ethereal things. I say, I don't. I talk about very, very basic things. Over and over. <laughs> over and over again. Yeah. Because the other motto of my business is, uh, you know, it's all about the best execution of fundamental skills. That's, that's it. it. That's the golf swing too, isn't it? That is the golf swing. That's the yeah. golf swing. Yeah. And and I think that, you know, I, part of it is I don't think like, you know, I get, I think every sport at a really high level gets very romanticized, you know, and, and there's a way people think of. There's a mythology, you know. Yeah, mythology. there's a mythology. And, and they, there's a way of thinking. And it's, again, one of those fundamental things I always talk about when I first get students. Um, and it's like, you know, we're, we're not like these crazy guys with really fast reflexes that is not a race <laughs> it's that's the thing you always get is it's the death wish with fast reflexes like that's what they think <laughs> so they so they think it's like kind of in a way you know you think of all the marvel movies and all that stuff all the superhero movies they think it's almost superhuman stuff you must be doing and you're like no it's actually really boring what i'm doing it's like i have taken something that's fundamentally very simple and I have gone down the rabbit hole of diminished return for decades on it. Right. And, and I, in, instead of now finding seconds, I'm finding thousands and ten thousandths of a seconds in, in, in my driving. And it's like to a normal, rational person, there's nothing more boring than dealing with minutia. But, you, you, but that, and that's the reality of it. So they don't want to hear any of that. But that's what motorsports really is. It's this it's this dogged determined focus like you were describing with with mike skeen and tom long it's like it's this you, you you just you won't ever let go like there's nothing there's nothing you won't do for another ten thousandth of a second That's you know right. it, it's like that and it's That's and it's right. it, most people they're so much smarter than that <laughs> they're like no they're they're just easier things to go do than that but it's like that's how you get to be you know, at an elite level in anything is, is most rational people just go, I'm bored and they walk away, you know, but you're like, no, 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 I, I'm a dog on a bone here. I can't let this go. I'm, I'm kind of mad. You know, I get that I got pretty close to what a good driver can do, but at, that's not good enough, you know, and a lot of people will kind of check the box at that point and go, yeah, I'm going to go, you know, learn a new sport or do a new thing or new, have a new, you know, activity. But they realize, again, like you described, someone with a vocation doing this, you know, we're, we're so off the rails into, into, and down the rabbit hole into looking at such fine detail right. of, of combinations of, again, three simple controls on a car. Right. You realize right. infinitely it changes because tire dag, fuel load, right. weather conditions, you know, the track green coming in, you know, all these things are just like, it's this dynamic to us, like this crazy unsolvable puzzle. Cause we'll never, ever do a perfect lap. Let That's alone right. 
perfect corner. Um, that's right. And like you said, someone can always jump in the car and drive it better than you. And that's that's the kind of stuff that drives us insane. Like <laughs> if they do that, they can't be more than a tenth faster. <laughs> because right, right. I lose my job if yeah, they are you know so that that's the kind of like the reality of driving and it's like it's and it, it's like driving around the skid pad and it's like I want you to feel when the car understeers mm -hmm. and they're like really how many laps are we going to do like this I'm like till you can tell me when it understeers. as many as it takes that's, that's right. right and it's like there is nothing more mundane to do in the realm of being taught how to drive than driving at 25 miles an hour around a little circle and going, uh, now, uh, how about now? <laughs> you know? And, and, and it's crazy. But again, even with like an indie car guy, like that is so critical to what we do is to not only be able to, to react to it is not good enough. It's to be able to anticipate it accurately. Absolutely. And that's why you're mm -hmm. always kind of, having to dip your toe because as I described a moment ago, the limit of the car changes every single lap and every single corner and every single phase of that corner. Right. And there needs to be subtle adjustment in everything to keep the car technically on the limit or we start kind of phoning it in. And now we realize we've been undershooting it for a while. And, and well, that's, why me, everyone, that's why everyone's gone, you know? Well, you know, you, you, you've hit the nail right on the head because again, this is all information that is required in order to be able to tell the car what to do rather than simply ask it. Yeah. And that is where a majority of the people that I work with, they come to me saying, I'm asking the car to do this like and it's that. not doing it. And I'm going to say, okay, we're going to flip this on its head. And we are instead are going to adopt the approach that we are going to now tell the car what to do. Are we going to do that in the fastest corner? No, we're going to start in the slowest corner or we're going to send you to dirt fish or yeah. we're going to send you to team O'Neill or we're going to send you to the skid pad. We're going to do whatever it takes so that you know, before it happens, what is going to happen? Because if you don't, you're never going to get there. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's really cool. And, and I think, you know, that's, that's a great point, you know, tell it rather than ask it and to tell anything to anyone you have to know that thing yes. right so asking exactly. asking is like are we gonna do are you gonna do it yes, <laughs> like yes. telling is yes. like i know you can do it and you're gonna and i know how to make you do it and we're gonna do it you, you know, know it's it, it's really cool that you said that because ross bentley loves working on people's minds and their mindsets and all that and i keep telling him and i tell him to his face and i tell him when we're on podcasts and and videos together, I said, I don't, I don't go for any of that stuff. I want my driver to put that right front tire on that quarter. I don't really care about trigger words or their mindset or anything else. The, the <laughs> issue is that I want them to be accurate. I want them to be consistent. And I want them to know before it happens what is going to happen. And I want them to ask the car. To, I don't, I want them to tell the car to do it and then deal with what the car does when it does it, you know? Um, and none of it to be a surprise. No, no. And, and, and that's where your zero steer works perfectly for me because oversteer or overcorrection is a surprise. It is yeah. a miscalculation. It yeah. is an incorrect input resulting in an in in a inefficient result absolutely so, so the point is let's narrow that down a little bit so instead of sending it and fixing it let's skate in it you know yeah. let's skate in so so that's that's the other thing that i use the sims for is i say look i i love the sims because it trains the eyes to recognize y'all before that butt feels now, not every driver can do that. Not every driver can tune in to the fact that they see the field of view abruptly shift four degrees to the right and know that the ascent is coming out mm -hmm. in time to fix it. Um, but those who do can translate that to better, narrower 
on the limit behavior in real life, I think so. Yeah, I think that's a it's a great point. I always used to, you know, I still use it, but I always say that that the better you are as a driver, the higher frequency of mistakes that you will make. Um, and and you know, and every, everyone, I love, I love. That's a, that's a beautiful it. way to say it. Yeah. Higher frequency. They're not. They're thinking the amount. Mm -hmm. They're not thinking of the overshoot, undershoot, under overshoot, the undershoot amplitude of the mistake. The, the, the 20,000 hertz exactly. instead of 10 hertz yeah. stuff ends up off the track. Yeah, uh, it's, I love it's that. The, 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 la that. the lazy correction with yeah. the big overcorrection that brings the car well below the limit and then taking it up and over again and then back down again. And then, yeah. you know, as you get better, it starts to get finer and faster and then you get really good and it, it gets so imperceivable. And that's when we get to use the magic word. It's not a correction anymore. It's just an adjustment. That's right. <laughs> and that's a beautiful way to put it. It's a beautiful yeah. way. So one thing I will tell you about data is data. One of the great values of data is that it does allow you to assign objective numbers to heretofore subjective measures. Yeah. So like this is my friend Ray Phillips has a strip chart he calls steering panic. I like and, that. And, and, and steering panic is tracing the amount of movement of the steering and correlating it with the amount of movement in the car. Yes. So what happens is if you have something that is out of sorts, out of ratio between the actuation of the steering input and the car's response to it, you tell the driver, stop that. <laughs> Don't do that. It's not doing anything because some kind of that irrational, you know, that irrational fear thing where they have a perceived limit and are swearing they're going over it. That's right. And they're yeah. and they're putting a correction in for something that doesn't require a correction. There's another kind of interesting fun aside to that. I had a I don't did you do you know uh, Chip Panko by chance? Yeah. yeah. So Chip with uh, Skip Barber, he and I worked together hip to hip for probably 20 years and um I used to make fun of him. We rode around with each other all the time uh, doing yeah. stuff because we were always doing setup days together. And so we were, you know, setup days for programs are like, I've got all the Sebring to myself and I have That's horses. Nice. Yeah. That's, <laughs> you the know? That's the best. It's the best. Yeah. Or I have Vipers or whatever it is. You know, I've got these cars. It's just us. And the entire track is rented. And all we need to make sure is we have some cone set up by the end of the day. And we've done it. So we just... You know, I have a, a, a great phrase from um, my friends at Michelin and two really good guys at Michelin that you might know, uh, Spencer Gaswine and uh, Brian Smith, who were two of Michelin's top test drivers in the 90s into the 2000s. But they, they taught me this term called HQDA, high quality dicking around. Yeah. And it was when they would go out every morning when they got to Michelin, they were the at limit test drivers for the Michelin cars down at the Lawrence Proving Grounds in South Carolina. And their HQDA was every morning they would go jump in this fleet of cars that were provided by all the manufacturers that had Michelin tires on there. And they would, you know, a caged, you know, M3 lightweight. They had one of an E36. They had a, you know, a 911. They had kind of one of everything. And they would go out and they would just do an hour of driving just to kind of get in the mood and kind of blow out the cobwebs and get the right mindset. Draw overdrive for a little bit. And then and then they could go in and they could drive the cars, you know, very precisely and do their subjective testing that they would do. And so so that high quality dick and round is what Chip and I were do, would often do. And I, I still do on any setup day that I go Absolutely. do. And well, one of funny, the things, funny you yeah. should bring those guys up because Brian Smith is a dear friend. He's a great guy. He's so funny. Yeah. Bring my yeah. name up around Brian Smith. Now he is, of course, head of, you know, Ford Performance Racing School. Yeah. Um, but also the way he got started was he and his father started uh, track days with a small for profit. One of the first uh, called Track Time, which was bought by Bobby Ray Hall in the late 80s. And then Car Guys, which was very yeah. successful in the southeast. And um, Brian would run his uh, Fox Body Mustang. Uh, that he and his dad built and he you could tell already he was exceptional yeah he brian cunningham who was a stalwart at the psds for a long time yeah the sport driving school in birmingham and i used to just 
wear each other out. And this was before any of us had any idea that we would be in this profession as a profession, which was what was really, really fun. But he, of course, went on with Spencer to be the first general managers of Kershaw, yes. Carolina Motorsports Park. And then, uh, you know, after they left Michelin and and now they're doing great things. We'll, yeah, we'll and I, just, I just saw Brian at Petit Le Mans. I hadn't seen him in a long time. Um, I, I, I talk to Spencer every once in a while. And, and uh, even like they... Their boss was Chris Baker. Um, he was the head of motorsports for Michelin North America. He started out engineering and he was one of the tire engineers on the MXX3. Um, and that's when I went into Michelin, Chip and I, we went into Michelin and we were the first guys to ever get qualified to drive around Lawrence. This is when it was very secret. Anything that went on in Lawrence at this point was now they'll let public in there and they do stuff in there when when they're when they aren't doing you know, testing where they have to keep cars concealed and all. Yeah, that. so so twenty five years ago, I got clearance to run the two mile high speed test course at Lawrence. Right. Yeah, and we used to go there and do all the testing with with those guys. But to my point, like what what I was talking about with corrections is what sent us down this lovely little Michelin path was <laughs> um, was uh, that I used to always you know, we used to ride with each other, and I would ride with Chip, and Chip had really fast hands. And he's very, very quick, like really quick. And um, and I used to always make fun of him. And we used to have this existential conversation where he would put a correction in. And and uh, I'm like, the car didn't do anything. And he's like, I'm anticipating it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it became an existential conversation because you're, you know, it's like a tree falling in the forest, right? If I right. put a correction in, but the car doesn't slide, did I need to put the correction in? And then, you know, you start to see that on data and you're like, wait a minute, he's not crazy. Right. He's not crazy. Right. It right. is that that's actually what anticipation ends up being. That's it right. ends up being, especially for understeer, it's much easier to understand. Sure. For understeer, it's really easy to understand because it's it's generally just a throttle adjustment. Right. And it's just it's it's just a step in the throttle. Instead of you progressively winding the throttle up on corner exit, you just pause it for it may be a millisecond. It may be a tenth of a second. You just pause it. You're like, the car was about to understeer. I need to get the wheel a tiny bit straighter before I try that much throttle. Yeah. And, and that's all in the nuance of what we're always doing. But like on entry, or, you know, of course, you could get oversteer on throttle application too, but uh, on exit. But, you know, on entry, you're coming in and, and you're sort of anticipating this rotation. And you're anticipating, you know, the zero steer of getting the car in there. And uh, and you get in a little hot, you know, the, the Mike Skeen version of it, where maybe you're a mile an hour or two too hot, but you know you can catch it. it. That's the kind of thing that I'm talking about, where there's like a little flick of the wrist. But when you're riding shotgun or looking at the data, you're like, I didn't see the rear end. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't see that. Loose. <laughs> it didn't actually go. And they're like, that's because I did that, you know. So it was going if, if you yeah. think about like that little correction, so – the car is starting to build inertia to rotate and it is building rear slip angle fa faster than front slip angle. And of course they're anticipating that rear slip angle is about to go over the peak and it is going to slide. Right. And so they'll put in that little whippet of just that flick of the wrist of correction pre slide, right. which will slow down the Relax. rate of slip angle, the rate Relax. of slip angle built or the, the yaw rate of the car. They'll just knock the car's yaw rate down momentarily, just like that pause and throttle. Yeah. And the tree fell in the forest, and they were nowhere near it, but they heard it anyway. They heard it anyway. <laughs> that's and a that, great, great analogy. It really so that, I think that's a cool thing. But that's like that when I was talking about like us who us anyone that dedicates their lives to this thing and gets to this level. That's the stuff that's that you're looking at. And it, it's really cool. That's where data's cool. Sims are cool. Um, where it's something that I, I swear I used to just make fun of him for, even though I knew it worked. But it was just funny. And he and I, I made him. I, I got it to a point where he was really self conscious about it, which I knew I was making headway. <laughs> where <laughs> where the car <laughs> would slide, and then you'd fix it. You're like, now are you happy? <laughs> kind of <That's> <laughs> but but that's the kind of when you talk about 
you know, HQDA, like how useful is it to go and do that? And to do that next to someone like you were suggesting, you're even doing it on the simulator where you're you're watching them in real time, watching where their eyes are. I think all of that, like that's the kind of stuff, like to me, that's the value of a professional coach. That's the value of what you bring to the table where you could you can do that to them. I thought about how expensive it is to go out on a racetrack and how hard it is to make fundamental improvements on a racetrack, stuff that should be done on a paddock, where you have a facility there at VIR where, where you know, you've got simulators and you can, for a whole bunch less money, I'm, I don't know what you charge there, but I'm assuming it's a bunch less money than putting your car on the racetrack. Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. You know, I don't do it as much as I used to do it, but I, I still do it. And, I, uh, you know, the big thing is I this idea of having eyes on the video of a driver who has just come in from a session. One of the things that people say is a reason to hire a professional is they say, you know, I'll point out, look at that rotation. And they'll say, what rotation? I said, let me slow it down for you and explain in every step and detail exactly what happened to you right there, because I want to see more of that. And so, so all of a sudden you're able to sit there and say, you can see that your generation rate, which is different from the amount Yes. And bring that all together with the geometry of the corner entry yes. together with the three control inputs and build a story around it that can help their comprehension, understanding. And then you see that light bulb go on and then they make it their regular execution yes, absolutely. rather than a special one. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I was I was watching um I was watching some sim stuff the other day online. And the guy was very, very good. And the way he was described, I wish I could remember who it was, but it was really good. And he was talking about, um, unfortunately, he was describing pointing the car as rotation. So he was using rotation all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and he said, you have to rotate the car into the apex. And I, and I, I, was, I, was, I loved everything he was saying and how he was saying it. But I'm like, rotation is different. Your rotation is intentional rear you know, slip angle versus right. front slip angle to point the car into the corner. So rotation is pointing, but pointing isn't necessarily rotation. Right. So it's it's under and it, and there's only certain circumstances where we want to point the car, usually in low to mid speed corners. You know, where we want to actually rotate the thing and and maybe increase that slip angle and yaw angle to straighten it out to get a better exit because we know that's worth time. Um, you know, versus momentum in a higher speed corner where that's more important. And so that was one of the things that, so it's like that ability to differentiate between those two subtle things, but it's really, really important, especially when you consider like, that's exactly what we're trying to teach in those fundamental exercises is how you have this immense power over the car because you're telling it what to do. You have this, this power over the vehicle to choose its attitude, whether it's going to enter with understeer, or whether it's going to enter slap sideways like you're a, a professional drifter. Uh, or hopefully something much more subtle in between that's fast. Yeah. And and um, and that's the kind of stuff where you've got to make sure the vocabulary is on point. The descriptions are really clear. And to what you said early on, like one of the things that people picked up on you, and it was the same thing with me, by the way, like how I ended up even coaching in the first place, um, because you can explain a complex thing simply. And, and I think that's what you pays your money for, folks, more than anything. And that's the thing where I, if I had a major beef with club level anything, it is like their vocabulary is all over the map. So not only is their technique guidelines, not rules, because they haven't really nailed it down themselves, but they describe things in wildly different ways and they put emphasis on wildly different things. And so you end up with a, you know, you go from one instructor to the other in these programs, just from luck of the draw, what day you show up or, you know, this guy teaches the entry level guys, this, 
and you find they're on completely different lines. You know, they're they're describing things in completely different ways, and um, and of course that to you know showing a little bit of empathy and understanding. If I were that student in that position. And I had just got through this basic level stuff. Now I'm into where I can go out on the track by myself now. You know, the first time I've ever been able to solo out there. And now the guy who who I talk to is saying everything completely differently and putting a different emphasis on everything. But that's to me, like if, if you want to single out, if you're trying to figure out whether you want to go out and get a coach, that is the big thing that I'll use that word efficiency that makes you much more efficient learning is you're going to a top person from day one and you're hearing the right things described the right way, given the right priority and emphasis from the beginning. And then that process of becoming a competent to good to maybe one day a great driver, you're doing that and saving a ridiculous amount of time and money, not to mention a ridiculous amount of frustration along the way, having to relearn things because this coach likes to teach in a different way. Um, that's the stuff you should really consider and why it's why Peter's on this podcast in the first place. <laughs> well, I know that I can have this conversation with you and you'll just go, uh-huh, not the, what are you talking about? That I, yeah. that I do get at the club level when I talk about things like this. Sure. Well, I mean, the best part about it is, I mean, there's a whole, there are a whole lot of good emissaries for the professional coaching in the professional coaching world. I mean, I, I told you before there, we, we don't have enough time to go through all the names, but I, I think of Stephen McAleer. I think of Grant Maiman. I think of, uh, you know, just a whole bunch of people. Uh, Ryan Lewis. Uh, oh, uh, David Twatty, Ron Zitza. I mean, you know, it doesn't really matter. Uh, other than the fact that these people have have taken to their heart to learn as much as they possibly can. So they are telling, not asking. Now, the other thing about a professional coach is instead of being fed a particular curriculum, a conflicting curriculum, which you've just pointed out in a club setting often, is you can sit there and with some authority, get good information. And what I was, all I was going to say was when I, th I thought in the beginning, my business was going to be primarily intermediate solo in driver's ed, besides my competition clients, it was going to be intermediate uh, solo or newly soloed um, driver's education or track day people. It was not. It was advanced solo people and instructors who said, I have heard so many differing things. Yeah. I just want to hear one thing, one thing. <laughs> That's all I want to hear. And I said, I can tell you one thing. Yeah. And the other beautiful thing is that as people get better, the people that I work with are intensely curious. Absolutely. I, That's what I don't think that all this is motivated by. I would say that I I can count on two hands the amount of unpleasant, unproductive engagements I've had in 35 years. Including this one. <laughs> <laughs> the, the beauty of it, though, is that every one of these folks wants to do better. That's the bottom line. They yeah. just want to do better. That's all they want to do. And we can help them do that. You yeah. Know, yeah. Sure. It is. It is. Um, and it you know, you have so many, it's always tempting. I mean, I think, I think this is true of us. You know, we're skeptical these days. We get a lot of, you know, not, not to politicize anything, but, you know, we get a lot of misinformation in our sure. lives these days. And so we're bound to be more skeptical. We don't respect authority like we used to, you know, all of those things are changing culturally a little bit. And, uh, and I think it makes it a lot harder for those folks to kind of suss out like, you know, what professionalism even means anymore. Um, and, and what are the benefits of going that path that initially certainly is a more expensive path. You add it up in the end, you know, and, and shoot, I, I do this all the time with, you know, doing stuff with Michelin and with their tires and people are like their tires are more expensive. I'm like, yeah, but they last longer. So yeah, the initial upfront cost is more, 
but they're going to last long enough to offset that cost. And that's not unlike the difficult conversation we have where if you want professional coaching, yes, it's going to cost more, but it is so much more efficient. You're going to get so much more of that amount of time that you spend with that coach is going to be so much more productive that the net net in the end is it's so much cheaper and you're a better driver at the end of the day. And you probably haven't crashed a car along the way that could have been potentially crashed with, with less efficient coaching. Well, that's right. And, and the thing is that uh, it is a sense of entitlement that people bring to the track, especially post pandemic. Cars are now capable of race car competitive. They, they are. I was education they off are. the showroom floor. Yeah. You have, in order to afford to buy one of those cars, you need to be a seriously type A personality and you need to be very successful and very good mm -hmm. at your profession or your business or whatever got you the means to indulge. The problem is that I see a large number of people. We used to have a joke among professional coaches uh, at PCA events, and, and it's no secret. Um, and that is sell your company, buy a cup car. <laughs> and, and, you know, that's we say that with the it's foreboding, yeah. with the foreboding that it will be followed by an inevitable crash, you know. Uh, and then the person will get soured to the sport and walk away. Yeah. And we don't want that. No. I tell I tell team owners and I tell, you know, I tell event organizers all the time. I say, we are in the entertainment business. If people have a good time and come away with something of value, they will come back. They'll be happy and they will come back and they will gladly open their wallet to you. As long as it makes sense and as long as they're getting value and as long as they see not necessarily continuous improvement, but trending improvement. Yeah. And they're enjoying so, they're and they're fun. enjoying themselves. That's the bottom line. I mean, yeah. Ross Bentley signs off of, of on his Substack and, and his other postings uh, all the time, you know, have fun out there, you know, whereas I, on my Substack, lament the fact that, Incidents on track at track days and driver's educations are uh, events are up substantially per passenger mile. Yeah. Than they were pre pandemic. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, I think that again, it's that philosophy of, you know, reliance obviously on traction control, stability control, uh, ABS, all of that, where, you know, people just are driving their cars. They're very capable cars. And, and the thing is, is it, it's a great system. Those systems work really well as long as you're within about two or three miles an hour of an overshoot on that entry of that corner. Uh, anything beyond that, you're going off the road and you're crashing your $180,000 911 GT3, you know, and, and that's, that's what we're seeing a bunch of is people driving on those systems. It made me think a little bit, you know, when you said that road cars are, have this high performance level these days, and they absolutely do. I mean, it, it is staggering. Of course, you look at the GT3 RS where it has an adjustable differential <laughs> on its damn steering wheel, you know. Absolutely extraordinary. And, and of course, what, you know, how much grip a Cup 2 tire has or a Super Trofeo oh, uh, tire has. You know, so, so there, those, those road cars, I, I remember, you know, just in, in the Black Wings at VIR with the little... Right. Uh, the little uh you know data acquisition system on the black wing and i'm doing 2.2 g under braking with a cts 40 black wing. That's right. that's you know right. yeah with the compression but that damn sure. it that's a big number that's a huge number that's, that's a, a big, big number for a sedan a, yeah you know, on, i mean that's a, a bigger number than you know grand am gt cars were doing 20 years ago yeah so. and that's on that's on a p4s not on a cup 2r you know so oh. it's, you know so it, it's it, that's what they can do and it makes me think if you, I don't know if you've ever dabbled, you probably have at some point, but have you ever seen how they do motorcycle training at track days? Mm -hmm. um, how the bike guys do it. Now the bike thing, the bikes have always been really fast. That's the thing, like we're just now getting cars that are capable of running lap times close to uh, production-based race cars. So 
you know, the road car is almost as quick as a GT4 car um, around the track, for example. Um, and bikes, though, have always been like a really, really good super bike has only ever been a few seconds off what a Moto GP bike can do. Right, right. So, and if you look at a road car now, like you think, oh, okay, so a, a GT3 Porsche is pretty close to a GT4 Porsche factory race car. You're like, yeah, it's not that far. Um, or a GT or a, a Cayman as it would be in that case. Um, it's not that far off, but a Formula One car is still, 30 odd seconds faster and it's still 15 seconds faster on coda than a than an indy car you know so but but think about the motorcycle a super bike is three or four seconds off what a moto gp bike can do crazy. and it's been like that for quite a while like the the real advantage of the moto gp bike is it's made out of exotic materials right. and it's on a ultra sticky tire that you can't you don't have access to really and so that, that that's what's really different about the bikes. And um, and so they've always had this amazing coaching methodology because mm -hmm. they're so flipping fast. And obvious, and the other thing is, is you don't just, you can't spin a bike. <laughs> well, <it's interesting. laughs> no one's ever really done it other than stunt riding. Um, it's you know, interesting you say it, this. It, it's a it, wrist, it, it's a collarbone, it's an ankle. It, that's like a, it's a concussion. That's like a, a best case scenario uh, mm -hmm. on a bike, like for, for going off. And it's a set of leathers and you're buying really expensive plastic for the bike and maybe a new set of forks. So it's, you're spending thousands of dollars to put that thing back together and, and nursing a potential injury. So they're, they're really dialed in. I would also, I used to teach a lot of um, the uh, government type driving that you would do for the Navy SEALs, um, sure. for the Special Forces. I did that, a lot of that at Summit Point. Uh, back That's a great there. program. That great, great program. I was with BSR for a long time, have a lot of good friends, learned a lot there. But their gun training was incredible. And since, since they were coming out and doing driving and gun training at the same facility, I got to sit in and do the gun stuff too. I That's learned good. more about teaching at that gun training than I did doing anything else. Because yeah. that may be the one thing that's more dangerous than car stuff other than, than a pilot's license. That's, they're all in the same realm yeah. of being a very dangerous thing to teach someone. And so, damn it, you better be on point when you teach it. Absolutely. And, and, the, and so I learned a lot from the, the gun training. I learned a lot from that tactical training and, and the understanding of, of sort of how you have to have this stuff really, really nailed down. And, right. and because there is so much risk involved and the motorcycle guys kind of have that methodology baked in whenever you go do a simple track day with a simple club that these guys, if you go talk to the average person at a motorcycle track day, they have been to every single professional school, right. all of them. Yeah. And they do multiple. So like the Keith code school, uh, Pridmore, there's quite a few of them around the country, but if, if you go to a track day for cars and go, who's been to Skip Barber? Who's been Polecat? Who's done right. some days with, with Peter? The, the number of people proportionally compared to motorcycle, it's minuscule. Correct. And that, so correct. there's a, there's just a different mindset because the car is so damn safe, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. now they're getting really fast. And they're getting really expensive. So while they're still pretty safe and it's hard to get hurt in a car, people do get hurt in them. We know that on these track days and it occasionally goes all the way, unfortunately. Um, but because it's still fairly rare, and even though like you're saying, sort of the mile per crash statistics are getting worse, these are people that can afford to write another check for another cup car, you know, or whatever it has well, I mean, to be. I mean, the advent of track day insurance yeah. is, a, is a relatively new thing. Everybody was always self-insured before that. And honestly, I think that held some egos in check. Um, so there's that, you know, that's, that's the yeah, biggest. All of that adds up into sort of what is sort of our, um, struggle that we have when we're, we're very genuinely trying to give people uh, the, the techniques to drive a car really well and to do it safely. 
And yet, you know, it's a very tough sell because of sort of that Dunning-Kruger, I don't know what I don't know. And they feel like they're fast, as fast as they should be within their given group. So you're trying to sell them snake oil, basically, is what it adds up to. And of course, um, that is not the the intention of what we're trying to do. We're, we're, you know, we're very genuine in saying there's this nuance to motorsports that where the true enjoyment of, of motorsports comes from. Once you can tell a car what to do to steal your turn, Peter, and and tell it to do cool things like I do want to oversteer. I don't want to understeer because no one wants to understeer. Let's just be honest. And, and to have that ability to hop from car to car to car in cars where other people complain about understeer, people complain about it. I, I'm a journalist sometimes and all my journalist friends, except for one or two, said C8's understeer. I went and tested a C8 and I was going, it never understeered on me. Not One of the one. most neutral neutral street cars I've ever driven. Incredibly <laughs> neutral car. Like, put it wherever the hell you want it. it. It does it so easy as long as you understand how to trail brake and balance a car and entry into corner. It'll do anything you want. And yet, here it comes. And then, I, you know, I go drive with them and I realize, wow, yeah, there's, there's definitely a big differentiator between their driving ability and their ability to write about a vehicle, which happens sometimes. Some of them are quite good, but... That's generally the case. And and that's, again, that's where the fun stuff is to me. It's where you can differentiate and fall in love with a brand now because you can differentiate between the philosophies behind those brands and how they set up to handle. They feel very different. A McLaren versus a Ferrari versus a Porsche, you know, versus a really good Lexus versus an AMG Mercedes versus a BMW M car. They're different. They're different because the engineer's drive differently and that's been their core philosophy um throughout and that's why that brand is that brand and if you drive everything to the understeer limit of the stability and traction control none of that matters <laughs> not a damn thing <laughs> i mean yeah the lap times are different but as far as your impression of the brand it the cars don't feel any different one to the other you're just letting the electronics drive you around the track and that ain't driving folks no, that's sir. Not that's driving. Riding, that's so think, riding around. And all it is 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 a is it half a day in a paddock fixes all of that. <laughs> One half a day in a paddock. Go in there. Yeah, I think that's crazy. I would, like to, that. I would like to think that that a lot of the high performance driving education programs are beginning to understand that, and I do see some. They are integrating those programs, but not enough. I think, and I think it's because of of people like you and I, because I've, I've gone in and coached their instructors before. I go in and do that, take the whole group, and I'm like, we're going to spend a couple days. I've done that around the country. And I beat that drum mercilessly. They're like, we don't have a skid pad at the track we go to. I'm like, make them add one. Right. And, and I'm starting to see tracks adding car control areas and I'm not taking credit for it. I'd like to think that that is helping that I'm saying this. Oh, I think time, beating the drum all the time. is definitely helping for sure. Yeah. So, I mean, as long as we keep saying it, I'm going to keep saying it till I draw my last breath. Um, that, that This fundamental stuff is like you stop thinking that you're better. You're, you don't need to be Tiger Woods practicing his simple golf swing. It never goes away. You never stop practicing fundamentals and yeah. once you get that through your head like every year at least it's just like that gun training i was alluding to they have to go get recertified every single year to carry that's that right. firearm that's right. you know if you look around you at anything else that is dangerous pilot's license you have to get your hours in every year flying yeah. You have to have that logbook up to date or you can't fly. That's you know, right. it's it's the and yet here we are in a similarly dangerous sport, not having to do any of those things. So therefore, a lot of people not feeling it's necessary because it's not right. technically required to do it. But if there were anything I would get anyone to understand, it's like go get a guy like Peter, go to a simulator or go out in a paddock uh, in a car and do not drift. 
as tempting as it is, <laughs> don't worry, you'll get to do that later. What you need to do is understand ingrained responses to understeer and oversteer. You can fix them without a doubt, not only around a 25 mile an hour skid pad, but in a 130 mile an hour corner. You need to get to that level, right? And then you need to understand um, threshold braking and understanding how the, how braking is the most important thing in driving because it sets the corner up. Uh, get all of that stuff ingrained, get an amazing set of eyes and all that paddock stuff will teach you that. Um, and, and once you have that, you get to hit that button on the on your center console and turn those systems off and actually start driving and enjoying your car. That's okay. where you want to go. That's where you want to get. But you want to do that safely, which means you have to follow the steps I just outlined. And you have to be progressive and smart and make sure the smartest part is getting someone smart, like this gentleman that I'm talking to right now, to take you to hold your hand through this process. And you'll you'll never look at cars the same. You'll appreciate driving so much more because now you understand the nuance that makes us giggle about it. Um, it's you know, Cars don't all understeer people. You don't need to put a big rear bar on your car because it understeers. You can make it stop doing that dynamically as you drive it if you understand the technique of driving a car. Um, there's a reason that understeer is there. It's a good thing. And to be able to override it, that's better still, but you have to earn that ability. You know, so that that's all the kind of stuff where, you know, it's like we're just keep on creating enthusiasts. And I think people, if we do that, we do a better job with that. It's kind of to your point where you want to, you know, you were talking about, um, you know, getting people at, like at James Clay at Bimmer World where he wants to create enthusiasts. He wants to create drivers. He wants his customers to love doing track days. But I think that's where people kind of time out or get sick of doing it is they plateau, you know, and, and they plateau because they never took the time to find the nuance that makes this sport so sort of inspiring a passion. Like how can you not love ripping a car around at its limit? I saw Tommy Kendall last week and we were talking about that intrepid, that, you know, incredible downforce GTP car he had and turn five, the corner he crashed in, unfortunately, at Watkins Glen that, that uh, certainly was a, a big problem in his career, though he did bounce back and race again, which is great and had success yeah. afterwards. But he was talking about the entry of turn five at Watkins Glen pre-chicane, because he's part of the reason why there is one there now. Um, but how it felt taking that intrepid with just a brush or break at 178 miles an hour into Sick. turn five. Sick. Yeah. And then having the thing just kind of this little neutral drift, kind of guiding it down, kind of like your skiing story, right? Where he brings it in a little hot. So that's yeah. Tommy in, in a full down for his GTP car um, and doing the same thing. And, and, and that, like, mm -hmm. To us like you're almost drooling right now just contemplating it i can see it peter oh my god because i can envision it in yes. my mind the that, zero steer before the road levels out oh my god tracks out parallel perfectly with the end of the curbing on the left i mean hmm. i can see it in my mind <laughs> i can see it. that is what driving is all about it's getting to a point like that not relying on the electronics to get you through a corner you'll never feel it and, and so that's that's the thing. If I were to put that out to anybody watching this that sat through all of this uh, to the end, it's like that is the, the most amazing thing. It's just having a car under your control at the limit. And it's not a panic moment. It's absolute nirvana because you've got this thing just right where you want it. And you know it can't do anything to surprise you. It's right where you want it to be doing exactly what you want it to do. Exactly as you envision that corner happening, you're just driving it through without any conscious thought required whatsoever, other than the just pure enjoyment. Because I said that to Tommy, I go, that's kind of a sweet moment, right? And he goes, yeah. <laughs> it's, almost <laughs> like, it's almost like you talk to someone after they slept with a supermodel, like, what was that like? And they're like, yeah, it was pretty good. <laughs> you know, it's like, 
Not was, too many people get that experience. Yeah, that was that was Tommy describing that entry into turn five and just like just how amazing it felt. And it, it's such a privilege, right? That's what it was. It was such a privilege to be able to drive something at that level. Um, that's what that's what we do this for. That's what it's all about is this absolute connection with us and the vehicle with just complete confidence and having it just dancing with us right at the limit. Uh, you know, it, it's just, it's special. It's special and probably the most special thing we can do because you can get really, you can reach that level doing anything in life, but driving a car on a racetrack, there's this kind of skin in the game that makes it even more special. Yeah. And um, and so that's what this, this sport is all about. And I think it's with that, with that, Peter Krause, I think I finally figured out a spot to end this amazing discussion. Anything you want to add or plug uh, here, take your time and do it. Uh, and I just want to thank you. And we'll do a quick little close afterwards. But what what do you think? You have fun well, here? Well, Paul, I had a great, a great time. And you knew I would have a great time. And I knew I would have a great time. It's like driving a nice car, you know? Exactly. And, <laughs> and, and the thing is that if... Uh, I mean, the best part about it is I am available for one-on-one -on -one coaching at VIR uh, on a daily basis. I need some relative notice in advance. Uh, I'm not there all the time. I do have a facility there. Uh, I'll give you my contact information if you want to put that up in a panel at the end. Yeah, just say it, um, say it right now if you want. Say your email. Yeah, so it's, uh, the email is peter at peterkraus.net. So that would be Peter at P E T E R K R A U S E dot net. Um, my phone number is 919 740 1871. I take text messages. Uh, I have uh, a number of outlets, including the Krauss and Associates Facebook page. Uh, I also host a Substack called The Intelligent Driver. And I'm anxious for people to do that because we're actually going to be adding a uh, quite a treasure trove of actual case studies, basically a Harvard Business Review analysis of what works and what doesn't in very detailed terms in very basic skill executions throughout the next year. So that's going to be a lot of fun. Also, uh, Ross Bentley and I, through his Speed Secrets website, offer a uh, quite a comprehensive list of virtual track walks. Uh, these are very comprehensive, useful, and entertaining uh, rules on getting around a racetrack as opposed <laughs> to other ones. These are not our guesses. These are dealt, uh, these are derived from data from working with the highest level drivers in the highest level professional series. Uh, we have seen, uh, we have worked together with tens of thousands of drivers. Uh, and and thousands of drivers on record pace in their particular class of cars. So we know what works and we know what doesn't. And that is a really, really good resource. For somebody who wants to learn about a new track or is interested in learning more about one they already know. Um, but that's about it. I, uh, I really enjoyed today, Paul. Thank you so much. Yeah, it was really, really fun. And um, I think we make a good case, hopefully, to just never stop learning, you know, just keep on, just keep on attacking this thing because it, it is, it, it gives you reward for every little bit of nuance that you wrap your head around. You see things a little bit more clearly and you just have a little bit more enjoyment in those moments with those cars out on the track. And, and that's truly what it's all about. And um, Peter, again, I want to thank you. Uh, I knew you'd be a great guest and it turned out that was the case with all your great stories and um, the great history of how you landed where you landed. And I, I think what's, I always like doing that in the podcast because literally with all the podcasts I've done, no one has even been remotely similar in how they got to where they got. And uh, we all, we all take these weird, crazy journeys all over the map. And then, uh, you know, we end up talking to each other on a podcast. I think that's fascinating. That's yeah. worthy of a podcast right there. Um, so I want to thank you for coming out. And uh, and again, guys, um, hopefully you heard Peter. We'll try and put that information below. But uh, that was great that you spelled all that out from him. And uh, take advantage of this knowledge. 
If you've never been to VIR, the track, oh my God, it is world class. It's a real driver circuit. And if you can drive that track well, you can literally go anywhere in the world and be pretty confident you could drive that track too, including going to the Nürburgring uh, or anywhere along like that. So um, thank you again, Peter. Maybe we'll have you on there. You, you get frustrated and you need to vent, you come see me on the Optimum Drive <laughs> podcast. I'm here for you, buddy. That sounds great, Paul. We are like <laughs> of like minds for sure. Exactly. And I'll see you on Facebook, Peter, and uh, and any of the other social networks with trying to trying to help steer people in the right direction, literally, uh, as, as we go. So thanks, everyone. Um, and we'll see you next time on the Optimum Drive podcast presented by TFL. Thanks, everybody.